Why do you think people are struggling so much today? Anxiety is on the rise, depression is on the rise, a lot of unhappy marriages and relationships. We've pathologized human experience. The number of students over the years would come sit in my office and say, my dad passed away, my granddad passed away, my dad just moved out on my mom, my mom cheated on my dad, and I'm depressed. And I would often say, no, you're not, you're really sad. We just have so many duct tapes and pills and alternative whatever instead of just teaching people how to sit in grief. You have to act differently. You have to change the things that you do on a daily basis. You can't just think your way into being healthy. You have to change how you live. Just created a world that our bodies can't live in, man. We've created a disaster. John Deloney, thank you so much for coming on the Iced Coffee Hour. You have a really interesting story. See, you did crisis negotiation for a very long time. What was the one call that still stands out to you this day? I did crisis response for years with police departments and with my students. The one that comes to mind when you ask that question was a year or two ago. On the Dave Ramsey show, Dave and his daughter, Rachel Cruz, were taking a call from a woman who was asking, should she sell her house? That call quickly devolved into Dave asking, are you safe right now? And if you're not, like, give me a signal. And she indicated she wasn't. I just happened to be walking by and to go use the restroom by the studios, the call screener, she yells, get in here. And that ended with me on the headset with this woman walking her through her husband trying to steal her kid, a very abusive, scary situation to the point that I looked over and the police were coming and I, I took my headset off and I said, I think this woman's going to die. And it was a terrifying, harrowing moment. And I'm a big guy. So in previous crisis situations, you, I can get involved. This one was just on the phone and it was just walking her through. You need to get your baby and you get out of the car. You need to keep walking down the sidewalk. And she's like, he's chasing me. And it was, it was, oh, a, wow. it was a harrowing thing until the police got there. And all we had was her number. And so we're calling police department to police department and they were amazing patching us through. And it's another state. And so it's multiple jurisdictions, but ultimately they got there and we've got some great feedback on the back that she's safe. She got the care she needed. She's transitioned her life. It's pretty amazing. So what is a crisis negotiator and how do you get into that? I wasn't a crisis negotiator. That would be like a hostage negotiator. That's what my dad did. He was a SWAT team okay. guy. And so they worked directly with the police department. What I did was a part of a small team um, called the Victim Services Unit. But essentially, the police show up and somebody has passed away. Let's say there's a, a, a child who's died. They have to work that scene homicide back. They have to assume the worst and go for like, what happened here, right? That's really tough on a mom who's weeping because her child's passed away. So my job was to come in and sit with mom or my job would be to show up with the policeman and say, your husband's been in a car wreck and he has died. And here's what's going to happen next. And most of us don't even think about what happens if there's a body in your home. Like, how does that body get out of, right? And so there's a there's a process to walk through and, and making sure people have resources and stuff. So I'd show up to homes. I'd get a, a text on my cell phone and it would just say 187 or 1087 and it would have an address. And 1087 was the police code for someone's died. It could be a two-year-old. It could be a 16-year-old. It could be an 88-year-old. And you show up and whisper a quick prayer in the parking lot and you walk in the house and you're on. It seems like you can't even console somebody in that state, what is your aim then is to just bring them back down to like a sane level? I wouldn't say a, a sane level. So I'm thinking of a situation where it was 2 or 3 a.m. A boyfriend and girlfriend had been drinking all night and they got in a little tiff and he'd bought a new gun. And while she went to the bathroom, he walked outside and died by suit. And as you can imagine, it's a, it's a chaotic mess. And she ran out and saw him and tried to help but it was i mean it was just a disaster and so when we get there she's on her knees in the front yard at 3 a.m screaming covered in blood i mean it's a terrifying scene and so yeah th there's no peace there's nothing i can say that she her she can't absorb information my goal there is to get her to have a moment of peace and so for her in particular we locked arms and we walked down the street and we count the cracks in the sidewalk and we count the trees. and what i'm trying to do is get her body here Right. And only then can you say, you need to go to this hotel or you need to call your mom or you need to call your dad. Or, you, need, you need to go take the next steps. But until then, when you're in full fight or flight, man, you can't hear, you can't see, you're just reacting. What are the credentials needed to become that? Why should people listen to you in particular? I mean, I've got two PhDs. I have a three, a three-legged stool for wisdom, mm -hmm. right? Do you have the academic knowledge? You know what you're talking about. And I think there's a lot of people in our world that have an experience and they want to sell that experience right they got they went through a divorce they're you know they got sober and they think their particular path is 
the path and they want to tell everybody about it and create a course and sell it. Right. So I think, um, a, you have to know what you're talking about and B you have to have walked with a lot of other people because your experience is just your experience. Right. And a lot of other people have different experiences to the same end result. And then I think the third thing is you have to have gone through some stuff yourself. Right. And you have to have know what that weight feels like to be in that situation. Why do you think people are struggling so much today? It seems like anxiety is on the rise. Depression is on the rise. A lot of unhappy marriages and relationships. What's going on? Just created a world that our bodies can't live in, man. It's we've, we've created a disaster. And, um, then we blame the human body for not being able to respond to it. And so we've pathologized like normal human existence, man, made it the, made it a cancer. Do you think it's social media that's contributing to this? Jonathan Hyatt's new book is pretty compelling. If you just look at the map, it's like we started giving kids cell phones and mm. seven, eight, nine, ten, and then everything is just skyrocketed. So it's easy to say, man, it looks like we did this and then this happened. Um, but he's presented some pretty compelling data that no, it's causal. This caused that. Why is it so bad? It's multifaceted. But I think at the end of the day, we've taken kids' childhoods away from them and we've encapsulated their worlds in these little boxes. And the box is designed to loop you and to catch you. And that's just not an existence, especially for a developing brain. So are we finding that people are struggling more being younger or that older people are also having the same issues? Because I'm curious if it's something growing no, up on social yeah. media or if it's just exposure to it. In no, I, I think you're you're asking an important question that um, I would say my mental health research community is kind of wimping out on. We don't in our culture like to tell adults you shouldn't do something. We like to say like you do you, bro, and like whatever you feel like. We like we don't like to say hey, what you're doing is dumb, yeah. right? Um, even as like a mental health professional, you're not allowed to tell some theoretically. You're not allowed to tell your client you shouldn't do that, right? You have to be like, well, how does it make you feel? And like, why tell can't me. you say that though? Why can't you? Just I say, think it's, it's, it's a backlash to somebody imposing their particular set of values on somebody. I don't know. I think it depends on the con. Like Jack and I had a really good discussion a week ago, and I was telling Jack like. Hey, hey, this is going on, and what do you think of it? And Jack was like, well, how do you feel? And, and I told Jack straight up, I'm like, hey, if you tell me this is stupid and dumb, that'll put it in perspective to me that, hey, you know what? This is pretty dumb. I'm going to let it go. I think that's why you're seeing coaches, like this idea of coaching. Mm. It is quickly, I had a professor uh, 10 years ago, nine years ago say, therapist, y'all better be careful because coaches are coming for your job. I think what happened was doctors had the highest credibility in the in the helping professions. And so every graduate school wanted to medicalize the training so that it would it would add some sort of pseudo credibility to it. Instead of training people to sit with hurting people and just say, my God, are you like, are you okay? I wouldn't do that, right? Instead of that, it was very clinical, very separate, very diagnostic. And I think we have lost the soul of a lot of our mental health engagements. And so coaches are showing up and saying, I'll tell you, like you give me X number of dollars an hour, yeah. I'll tell you exactly what I think. And I think that's what people are desperate for. So you think that's a that can be a better approach just to tell it like it is? Or do you think it's 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 better to medicalize it or what's I have benefited from both. Yeah. I have benefited from from some gnarly stuff from my past, sitting with a trained master therapist. I call her my oracle. Mm -hmm. Um, but she's amazing. And yeah, she was very, very skilled. And I've also I I particularly have not returned to a few therapists. My wife got up and walked out of one once. She was walking through really gnarly uh miscarriage losses and the therapist leaned forward and said when's the last time you took some you time have you tried like a warm bath and a cup of tea and my wife just got up and walked out right because it was so it was so pandering and then there's times i call um a coach i've got two mm. and i've got a theological coach that i ask big picture questions and he kind of walks me through and then i've got somebody that's more of a business coach that i reach out to and say i need to think through this problem and he's able to say in my house i would not do that or I see this opportunity wide. How can you not see this? Let's talk through that. That's really interesting to try to balance placating somebody and just giving them the cold hard mm -hmm. truth right. and which one is actually more effective at bringing them down to a stable level. Well, and I think that's the, that's the art of it. There are some people that call into my show that I take the guess and think, mm. I need to tell them right now, you need to get out of this relationship. And then others, it's more important that they discover it for themselves. Like, oh man, I'm worth more than this. That's super interesting. I want to get more onto the medicalization, if that's yeah, a word, yeah, yeah. of mental illness, but we'll get onto that in one second. Cool. First of all, I want to ask the difference between medically diagnosed mental illness, mm -hmm. so like anxiety, depression, ADHD, versus general life anxiety. And how do you know which one you have? Because 
although the data shows that more people are have anxiety than ever and depression than ever, it's, is, is that like medically diagnosed? And even what is the merit of this medically diagnosed anxiety and depression? I really take a hat tip from Dr. Peter Atia, the great Atia. He, he started speaking, this is a while ago, more about emotional health. As a guy who lives in that world, I asked him, I was like, what do you mean emotional health? You keep saying emotional health. And he said, man, joy laughter, relationships, fun, like sadness. And I thought, oh, you're reclaiming humanity, right? So there is a distinct difference between a mental health disorder and an emotional health challenge, right? And so I do believe that we've pathologized human experience. The number of students over the years would come sit in my office and say, my dad passed away, my granddad passed away, my dad just moved out on my mom, my mom cheated on my dad, and I'm depressed. And I would often say, no, you're not, you're really sad. And we don't have a psychology for that. You're supposed to be sad, right? Your dad just left. Your dad blew up your family. You're supposed to be sad. Everything you're anchored into is now splintered. You should be, right? And I think we are rush so quickly to take away a, an uncomfortable feeling. And man, we just have so many duct tapes and pills and alternative whatever instead of just teaching people how to sit in grief. While we're on the topic of emotion, I recently sprained my ankle really badly playing basketball and I had to book multiple appointments just to get it checked out. Going through this, I realized just how hard it is to get a hold of a doctor, let alone finding a new doctor that accepts new patients and your insurance. Well, that's where ZocDoc comes in. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you could search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. All you have to do is download the app, type in the problem that you're experiencing, select your insurance, choose the date that you need an appointment, appointment and then click find care. ZocDoc then gives you a list of doctors in your area along with the times that they're available. Every doctor on ZocDoc comes with real patient reviews so they're a reliable source when it comes to finding the right fit. And once you find the right doctor, all you have to do is pick a time that works for you, fill in your info and then you're good to go. It's really that easy. Just go to ZocDoc.com slash ice to download the ZocDoc app for free. And once you do that, you can find and book a top rated doctor today at ZocDoc.com slash iced. ZocDoc.com slash iced. Thank you so much doc doc and back to the episode so do you think medical anxiety is over prescribed at this point oh absolutely yeah. yeah and i've been diagnosed with medical anxiety and it was exactly right right there was a season when i was on anxiety medication i my alarms were so loud and i ignored them for so long they were so unregulated that I needed to go do something so that I could do the things that I needed to do to be well. If medication is not the answer, what do you do instead? And how can you tell that it is medication worthy versus not medication worthy? Mm. I'll, I'll leave that final diagnostic to a medical doctor mm. and sitting with an individual client. I would hate for someone to listen to this and be like, oh yeah, dude, <laughs> cool, right? I would say as a generalized statement, medication almost never cures anxiety. When I'm anxious, and maybe that's the the the... In the small sliver I can add to this global conversation is that when you're anxious, your body's probably working perfectly. That's not the issue. The issue is it's to identify something that's not okay in your world, right? We're just looking at your beautiful fish tank mm -hmm. out there. If an alarm on your phone goes off, that alarm letting you know the pH is off in that water is not the problem. And you just deleting that app doesn't solve that. All your fish are going to die. That's anxiety. Anxiety is the, the, the alarm on your phone. The real question is, what's wrong in the tank? We got to go fix that thing, right? And so I think that most of us have grown up in a culture, follow your passion, YOLO, do whatever you want. This is a free country. You can say and do like whatever. And we don't like to live with the ramifications of our choices. And so we call it anxiety and then we numb it away. So I've actually found that analogy to be incredibly helpful for myself. Hmm. Like if I were to take an anxiety test, maybe given to me by a psychiatrist or something like that, I could check all of the boxes that would say, oh, you have, you know, anxiety disorder or whatever. But when I started thinking about it in terms of like, this is just an alarm that means my body is functioning properly mm. and I should actually fix the house in the fire rather than just mm. like remove the batteries from the smoke alarm, then it actually reduced my overall anxiety, which obviously sounds so intuitive. One thing is like, I hate bookkeeping, absolutely despise it. Mm. And all the time I'm like late and I'm anxious because of this, right? And so what I like to do with my anxiety is maybe I'll go for a walk or I'll do something like mm. that just calms me down, but it doesn't actually solve the root issue that's causing the anxiety in the first place. So although I could check every box that shows I have anxiety disorder, it actually fixed it 
by not taking any medication, mm. right? And I've never actually been diagnosed sure. with that or anything, uh, just by actually solving the root cause of the problem. So I found that to be incredibly helpful in my own. It's awesome. Well, and we may have talked about this previously, but I don't believe the DSM, like the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, the, the, the Bible for mental health diagnostics, that really served two purposes. One, to allow researchers to talk to other researchers. So if you're studying depression in California, you're studying depression at the University of Rhode Island, y'all could apples to apples these studies and talk. And it was designed for clinicians to talk to insurance companies to tell them, here's what I'm doing and here's my treatment plan. Here's the 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 stack of of symptoms this person has to call them even symptoms. And this is what I'm going to do about it. It was never designed to be released to the internet for all of us to Google in the middle of the night. Yeah. The best way I could say it is I asked one time I was meeting with one of my mentors. This is just a year or two ago. We're having dinner. And I said, can I ask you like a question I should probably know the answer to? And he goes, sure. And I said, is ODD real? Oppositional defiant disorder. Kids, right? Acting out. And he smiled and goes, yeah. And then he goes, and you've never seen it. It's like, what do you mean? And he said, ODD is not your kid throwing a tantrum and punching a hole through the sheetrock. ODD is, you ever been in a psych ward with five or six grown adults trying to hold a sixth grader down and we can't? That's op- like, And so he walked me through. Most of us, have re- we Google it. Oh, I've got that. I've got that. I've got that. I've got that. And then you go work in a psych ward and you see depression or you see anxiety clinically. And you're like, oh, I don't have that. That was the most common thing that my that when I would take people and walk them in and help them get checked into a psychiatric facility. Within one or two or three weeks, they'd be like, whoa, I'm, I'm, I'm not, okay. Yeah. I'm not this, right? Yeah. Or they would say, I'm glad I'm here. I need to get the help. But often it was, oh, I thought things were bad, right? Yeah. Do doctors have a financial incentive to prescribe medication? Because it seems as though a lot of doctors are very quick just to say, all right, you have this, let's prescribe this. Just kind of throw these medications at problem. Um, that was, uh, that's the takeaway I got from Dr. Tia, who lives in, more than behind the scenes in that world. That, yeah. And I think the incentive may be less about prescribing medication, but it may be more, I got 15 minutes with you. And 15 minutes is hard to sit down and say, Dude, tell me about your dad, tell me about your mom, tell me about what's going on that where are the fires in your home? I don't have time for that conversation. You hurt here. I can help with that hurt. And we sign it and move on. And I think doctors, because of, um, again, this, this democratization of information, which isn't bad. I just, we don't, we, we're not using it right. I think doctors are faced with a tough choice, which is doctors, patients come in and say, I have X, I want Y. Because they get all those ads for all those pills all day long and they have all the smiling families on them. The same as you go buy beer because they have the great commercials, right? Or whatever. And so a doctor's faced with a choice and the choice is I'll just make you happy or I have to say no. And I'm going to lose you as a patient because you're going to go find somebody yeah. else. So we have a recurring guest on the podcast. Dr. Yeah. K is his name. Okay. And he's very much in favor of like trying out Eastern practices mm-hmm. before we go Western. And his definition of Western is it's population based, mm-hmm. meaning they do a big study Perfect. of Perfect. a yes. thousand people. Oh, you have depression or you have depression symptoms. Mm-hmm. Take this pill. And maybe a plurality of them are actually solved by this pill. However, you also have a majority of them that aren't. Mm. And so we use that and we give it to individual cases and we assume that they fit the mold. Although what he says Eastern teaches is that you actually have to look inwards and see what it is exactly, kind of similar to the the smoke detector and the, right. the house analogy that you give. Well, and, and for me, it was important to find out, you no, know, my smoke detector is broken. That was a, that's another layer, right? And my smoke detector was, was going off about nothing, about ridiculous things. And so I needed to go get that tinkered with so that I can begin to do the things I need to do to get well, like you mentioned. Yeah. How do you know where the anxiety is coming from? Because sometimes you could just feel anxiety and you could say, oh, it's this thing, Mm -hmm. but it's really not. It's not that thing. It's maybe something deeper than that, or maybe it's something unrelated to that, that you're attaching to something else. How do you figure out where that's, where the smoke alarm, there's smoke? I I think there's five or six, seven things that all of us experience on a daily basis that kind of begin to ask yourself, man, when's the last time I exercised. When's the last time I got out in sunlight? When's the last time I was with friends that I didn't have to perform for? And I think you just start slowly digging into like, what's the state of my finances and my job? And then it's like, well, of course, dude, if you owe a bunch of money and you have nothing in retirement and you have a mortgage and suddenly you get an email at work, it's like, hey, over the next six months, we're going to start contracting our work for it. 
your body would be failing you if you weren't anxious, right? That would be insane. You might lose your house. You might lose your food, right? Those are basic survival things, and that's not anxiety's fault. That's not something you need to go medicate away. That's not. That's something you need to address those those challenges. Do you think there are any malicious or selfish intentions for the overprescription of medication or overdiagnosis of mental disorders? You said this on a podcast, and I found this very, very interesting, and I, I looked into it a lot more. You said medical health professionals wanted to be a part of the medical establishment in terms of getting paid. One researcher says depression, so does another, and so forth. So we all know what we're talking about and can report that to the insurance companies and get paid. Then the internet happens, and that becomes something we can just Google and get. Then it becomes the way that we talk to each other. Oh, you're sad, you're depressed. You're anxious or spung up, you have anxiety disorder. It becomes a label, and then just off to the races. It doesn't make sense that large scale, all of our bodies are failing us at the same time for the first time in human history. Right, that was the, that was the big aha moment, was sitting in a in a a nerd lecture at a university and the guy was talking about ADHD and the genetic links, right? And epigenetics and how those switches go on and off. And he said, by the way, it was, it's just an aside. And he said, by the way, this can't possibly be an entirely genetic issue because that's not how genes work. They don't all flip on at the same time. And that means it's got to be environmental. And that was the light bulb like, what if all these kids that suddenly have ADHD across the Western world, what if their bodies are right? What if they are just responding to two parents that are either absent or they are working 90 hours a week and they're shoved in a school system that, right? It's like, what if their bodies are all right or correct? What does that mean for us? And that was a way more terrifying thing for me systemically than everybody's a little bit anxious. Right? Now, what if is an alternative to that instead of it's these factors? What if? The factors have a consideration to that. They, they push people in that direction, but people watch others around them. They tend to mimic the other's contagion behaviors. effect, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so if they yeah. see, wait a second, a third of my class is anxious, a third of my class is they have ADHD, a third of my class is doing this, I think they're more likely to take on those behaviors. Like, it seems as though almost mental illness is something that's really, I don't want to say it's celebrated online, but people will post their stories or issues and get a lot of praise and support. It's incentivized in ways, yeah, in ways. In ways where if somebody said, hey, my life is great right now. I mm -hmm. couldn't be happier. I have a great relationship, a great job. People would say, well, I have this and I have this Well, because blah, 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 you, you're lucky. So it seems like there's this weird incentive where it's like the worst you post about yourself, the more support you get yeah. versus if you have your life together, it's almost dismissed. A hundred percent. And I, I, I think we can look at that through two lenses. I tend to look at that through a little more compassionate lens versus a, like a moralistic or character issue. Children are designed to lean into adults that are safe. And if the adults in their lives, whether they're teachers or mental health professionals or whoever, a teacher aides, whoever they happen to be around, get a steady diet of here's a disorder, here's a disorder, these disorders are on the rise, look for these behaviors, look for these behaviors. And you see a kid in the back tapping, right? I was always moving my leg and always tapping stuff, right? When I was a kid, it was Deloney, shut up and settle down, right? I would have loved some more compassion. But I fast forward and think of my son who's a middle schooler, he's tapping and he has a teacher that gently puts her hand on his shoulder and says, hey, this is a safe place for you. I'm glad you're here. And his body goes whoosh. It has now got a, a biochemical reinforcement that it can get connection through movement and being itchy because that teacher is compassionate and kind. And you do that over time, right? You get to high school and they ask you, do you have anything that we need to know before you take this test? Well, I get really, it's tough for me to take tests. Well, how about we just double the time for you? Would that be a gift? And you're like, yeah, right. And so all these things in order to help folks, and I've worked with students with special needs for my whole career, right? And I fought for their ability to go get those, those, uh, those things. But I think over time, your body responds to where is the compassion and kindness coming from? And because it's not coming from these other traditional places, we, our bodies are designed to be surrounded by aunts and uncles and weird cousins and a tribe of people that is gone. And you have a kid who finds himself or herself going to the bus by themselves because mom and dad are already at work. If mom and dad are even in the house anymore, is it 40% of kids born to a single family household? Biologically, that's madhouse. And it's not cool to talk about, but it's a madhouse. And so you take this kid and an adult puts her hand on their shoulder and say, you're safe here. Yeah. And you build over time an incentive. And now you've got a, an internet ecosystem that if you win, 
well, clearly you didn't just do it on your own. It's because you had some sort of fill in the blank. Or clearly it's because of these other factors, mm-hmm. not just because you worked real hard and got lucky. Um, and then the other side of it is, yeah, like, man, well, I've got this, this, and this, and this. Everybody pat you on the head. It, it's, it's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. And, oh, man, it was about three years ago, um, and it was, it was working with the team I have now, there was a light bulb that came off that was like, man, I refuse to participate in a world that tells you this is all you're ever going to be. I'm just going to pat you on the head. You go to the corner. We'll take care of it. I refuse to do that because it's not true. But how do you change that? Because it seems as though if your reward system is a victim mentality Mm -hmm. and that you're praised by that, how do you go against the grain and say – I'm going to give up all of this praise and choose to ignore it. Or like, like it's, it seems like a very counterintuitive thing to it's, do. It's hard. I think what we're lacking desperately is a picture. That's why I think your show is valuable. I think that's why these conversations are valuable. I think it's why my show is successful. I thought people wanted to listen to my show because I was so smart. And I thought like, yeah, it's growing because I'm so – they're not – that's not why they're there. I'm not that smart. They've never seen a big guy with tattoos sit with somebody who's hurting and be like, man, I'm so sorry. Like can I just sit with, in, with this – for a second, right? So I think we're, people are desperate for a picture of what it looks like. What's a picture of hard work look like? That's why people flock to the red pill world, right? They've never seen a picture of a masculine guy going and lifting weights. That's why they flock to you guys. They've never seen, their dads didn't teach them about money. And you're like, no, I'll teach you, right? And I think that's why this ecosystem exists and it continues to do so well. Um, but people don't have a picture of what that looks like in their house. They hear it and they hear it and it's like, you know what? This woman, this teacher of mine, she loves me. I'm going to go there. Well, I think one of the reasons I listen to your channel is because I like to think if I know these situations ahead of time and I hear your responses, I could fix them before they would even happen. Like I know some of your situations are kind of extreme. Yeah. And so I'm not like, you know, thinking, oh, that's going to happen. Right. But I like hearing about potential pitfalls to watch out for Mm -hmm. and hearing that like oh this marriage is failing because the partners aren't putting in the time with each other and not then you know it's it's the kids are taking all their time and focus away and they're both working and they haven't connected themselves and so i i like to take those little bits and pieces and say okay how can i apply that to my own life i love that and something's relational you can't hedge somebody's mom's gonna get cancer Right. Somebody's dad's going to die. There's going to be a car wreck. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's I think you do those things really to it's almost like a retirement fund and a cash account. Right. You do those things so that when the storm hits, you're you're low, you're you can, you can withstand that storm. But you know what? Before we go into that, I want to talk about a website that I use and read all the time, and that would be our sponsor, Yahoo Finance. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just starting to learn the basics, Yahoo Finance really has you covered. With Yahoo Finance, you could stay up to date on the latest market trends, track your favorite stocks, and get real-time financial news that matters to you. One of my favorite things about Yahoo Finance is that you're able to just type the name of a company into the search bar and then click find. You'll then get all the information you need from recent news articles to related videos, performance overviews, value valuations, analyst ratings, research. You get everything right there in one spot. Oh, and Graham, Yahoo Finance also makes it incredibly easy to stay on top of your financial goals by giving you powerful tools like customizable watch lists and interactive charts. It's really no surprise that Yahoo Finance is the number one finance destination with 90 million users visiting their website every single month. So if you're like us and you want the most comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand that's behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com. That's the number one financial destination, Yahoo yahoofinance.com. Again, yahoofinance.com. Thank you so much. Enjoy. And now let's get back to the episode. Another thing you mentioned that I really like is choosing your hard Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that like if you wake up 500 pounds, getting up out of bed, exercising, that's hard. It's a nightmare. But then not doing that is also hard. Right. So you have to choose which hard you want because they're both going to be hard. It's saving money. Yeah. Saving money is hard. It's the worst. Right. Like I want to buy that thing now. And also waking up and being 65 and you have nothing is really hard. And so you got to pick which one is going to bring you to peace and um, peace, peace <laughs> and, um, and, and, and joy. Yeah. There's obviously a lot of controversy around mental health. And it seems to a lot of people dismissive when someone says, oh, anxiety disorder is similar to a smoke alarm, even though it could be an effective thing. Why do you think it is so controversial to so many people? It's become an identity. It's who I am. Because if I'm not this, then who am I? Right. And I think it's become a label. And when you start messing with people's labels, man, it gets, it gets dicey. And 
if you're a young child and you're told you have this thing, this is the shape of your life for the rest of your life. They sit in the seat and they buckle in and that's, they head on down that track. And then you got some guy coming along and it's like, no, I was in that track too. And it's not true. Um, and the other side of it is like, I've got OCD. That's what was one of my earliest diagnostics. Okay. And so I've had to work through not healing from like my body responds to stress in certain ways. I don't fight myself when I check the locks at night. It's annoying, but I go check the locks a few times and I go to bed. Right. And, or I'll text my wife from, from being out of town. Did you check the, the garage door? She, or she'll text me per, like <laughs> prophylactically. Yeah. She'll be like, John, I doors locked. Right. <laughs> and so I don't fight it. And then there's other things like I need to be on time to work. Right. And so there's other times I consciously exhale. I can't go back up and check the oven again. I got to get in the car and go to work. And I live with that discomfort and then it dissipates. My body knows. I, feel like I you trust that. Solve that so easy because there are doorbells now, or not doorbells. There are door locks now that you can check from your yeah, phone. Yeah, no, but just, if like, one of your, your if you, one of your things is the tech surveillance, then that's one of mine. So I don't like having yeah, phones. Everything is on Wi Fi now. Like even exactly. your refrigerator, you could tell. Like, oh, that's on Wi Fi. I what, know, you can set I know, your temperature. I know. Oven, I'm sure is on. My Wi-Fi wife tells too. me I was born in the wrong century. So, okay. Yeah. Why do you think it's so important that people have identities like this that they latch mm-hmm. themselves onto? Oh, I am a person with blank, or this is a quirk of me, and this is why is that so? important for people you know it goes back to a thing and i wit i don't have any science about it right. um it goes back to a thing tony robbins said a decade ago which is our culture is addicted to problems we meet each other problem centric it's very rare that i enter into a world like i did today where you are showing me this incredible thing that you've created out like that you've built over three years you met me with joy isn't it beautiful outside Come look at my. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's very rare. <laughs> you said that I did. Yeah. I said you came during the best time in Vegas because yeah. it was so nice outside. Most people are like, yeah. keep with how hot it is. It's so cold. Like right, uh, my Uber yeah. driver, lovely guy, yeah. but greeted with, "Man, you're lucky on this one, dude." Because usually, that's how we. In, that's how. That's how we say <laughs> hello, so right? Um, you walk into the office and yeah. you just say, "Man, how was your weekend?" <sighs> You hear what's going on overseas. You should read the tweets yeah. this week, right? That's just how we but communicate. You know what, that's you good started point. It. But you started it. When you walked up, you said, oh, what a, a beautiful Maybe house. I started it, yeah. What, you know, is this grass across yeah. the street? I'm like, yeah, man, that's grass. It, 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 and and <laughs> someone like you will probably use it like, like Ooh, that's a good psychological mechanism, right? Right, to, to like a tool for the tool belt. I've just worked hard over the years because my natural disposition is worry and anxiousness. Yeah. And the great um, Amos Tversky, the psychologist, said worry is um, an absolute waste of your life he says it's stupid because if the thing you're worrying about comes true you actually experience it twice once you when you fret about it and once when it comes true and i was like yeah that's dumb and so for a decade i've been working to reset the default setting to walk outside and be like i mean it is super hot i'm gonna get to sweat all this crap out like it just instantly goes to what's the most joyful way i can experience this thing and then if i get hit by a bus i'll deal with that when i get hit by a bus that's a great frame of mind i know for a fact like if you're going to work and you hit traffic on the way to work Mm -hmm. the likelihood of you talking about that is like 50 times more than if it's wide open roads but if somebody shows up to work and you're like how's the drive in and they say dude was amazing like there was no traffic. I just sang really loud. Like like four cool yeah. Katy Perry Even songs. Even just saying that makes me happy. But yeah. at a workplace, people will be like, idiot. <laughs> like, oh yeah, must <laughs> be nice. Yeah. Must be nice to right. live where you, right? And that's our response to to people who um, present with the best possible scenario. Is that, but is that just human nature? It might I be. feel like it has it might to be, be at this point. I, I mean, like, our, like psychologically speaking, yeah. our bodies are wired to look for the tiger coming at us. Is there, right? Yeah, I got to say there's like an evolutionary of course. reason for like it, it talking about problems more than we are celebration. The, the, way the, other, <laughs> the other thing it could be is that the people who celebrate too much mm-hmm. maybe put a target on themselves, that they're a threat to others. Like, but isn't look that at this madness? Person, isn't that madness? Like but instead in a of... small tribe, right? And one one person is like single handedly being like, "Yeah, I slept with all these women, and I hunted the tiger, and I did this." Like that then person, there's going to be a revolt. Objectively, would be the threat to everyone else below them, and so it's almost like if you if you talk about your problems, you're seen as more of like one of the guys. Well, and, well, but here's the here's the challenge, and I love the great conversation. I I think it's it's the cancer of. This madness of this individualistic, it's what we're trying to do is not real. I have a life philosophy and I didn't come to it existentially. I came to it just practically. Have a guy. I didn't read a single article about COVID. I didn't understand. I, I couldn't read all of that virology. I did have a friend who's a cancer researcher that uses viruses to right? And so I called her 
I was like, what do you think? I'll ask you like, hey man, off air, like, what do you think I should do with this money? Why? Because you have it and you actually do it. We're so obsessed with, well, what about me? And I think that's just such an insane burden to carry. Mm -hmm. I will never research air conditioners because my friend John King is the CFO of an air conditioning and heating and plumbing company. I literally text him. I got to get a new air conditioner. What should I get? And he says, where are you? And he says, get this one. I don't waste a second researching it because that guy knows that stuff. And I love him and he loves me and he knows my kids and I love his kids. And similarly, if you said, hey, Deloney, I would, I put my money for me and my family here. Who do I think? I, I don't know anything about. Why would I? Who, who do I think I am? Right. I email or text George Camel on weekends and say, hey, dude, I've got this account. I need to move it. Where should I move it? And he'll say, I'd move it here. That's his world. I don't know. Right. And so I think we're so obsessed. I wish someone would come out and be like, I kill all the tigers. My bent is, dude, I need to learn from that guy, not that guy. Right. And yeah. I, I think it's just shifting. I want to be with you, not against you, man. This isn't about me winning. This is about us winning. You mentioned somebody in your book, you said it was a student of yours named Laura, who was brilliant, hardworking, hilarious, and who was going to change the world. However, after a diagnostic confirmation, she now just has anxiety. Mm. She came into your office and you guys had a really interesting exchange. You feel like you've had this conversation millions of times right. with different people who believed they had such bright futures. And then all of a the sudden they were diagnosed with someone and it rocks their world. Mm -hmm. That's my... I think all practitioners need to be careful about diagnostics. I've had a, a good discussion with Jordan Peterson about this. Like there is something important about naming the dragon. There's something important about saying you're not crazy. Here's what your body's doing. And here's it does it with a whole bunch of other people. They call it social norming, right? You're not nuts. There's a this this is happening everywhere. But I want to be very careful about saying, and this is forever, and this is your this is your card, right? This is you have a cap on you forever. Instead of saying, Hey, your body has, is responding to stress in these ways. Here's where it's going to be tough. Here's where you got to keep your eyes open. And here's where it might be magic for you, right? Somebody who is a little bit anxious might make an, an incredible attorney. And if you fall into the trappings of trying to make partner and working 90 hours a week and not taking care of your body, never going outside and drinking at every event, it'll bury you, right? So it's both. And I want an attorney who overthinks through things and over worries on my behalf about things. I want that, but I want that person to be healthy with that, with that bent. Right. So I think it's a matter of, oh, you've got this, like that can bury somebody without context. What do you think the importance is of being spiritual or religious or having friendships in terms of overall fulfillment and happiness? I just uh, blurbed a book from an experimental psychologist and that's the first time I've seen somebody, I know it's, it's happened for all human history, yeah. but it's the first time I've seen somebody say, all the psychological literature out there gets right up to the door and says those with a religious practice, those that plug into something bigger than themselves, financially, emotionally, relationally, psychologically, everything trends up. Now, of course, there's abuse and all that, but on the whole, and but they'd never go through the practice because it kind of unwinds the idea that there's nothing beyond, right? There's nothing bigger than us. That that self-actualization is the goal. That yeah. self-actualization is the goal. But do you think maybe that could be because people lack purpose? And I think religion gives people both a purpose and a community. And those two things contribute a lot to happiness. Like if someone has a community and purpose in their life, would that be the same as having religion in their life? I don't think it's borne out. Um, I, I did have a, um, a theological, a, a theologian, okay, he's a professor. He was challenging the data that says church has gone, is, is declining in America. And he's like, no, it's not. He said, it's just at CrossFit and it is guys getting together and watching the fights. And it is internet communities about like coral reefs, right? I mean, it's, people are still getting together and share, trying to, trying to figure out how to share and do life together. Um, I do believe there's something behind the curtain though. And I think purpose and, um, community lead you to that thing. And I think I would, I would rather people give it a shot yeah. than to try to deconstruct it before they get there. If that makes sense. That's fair. The main thing that stuck out, I've never been to church. Okay. Not in my entire life. I'm 25 yeah. years old. I thought you went with Ryan. I, I did go. I went for the first time yeah. about a month or so ago. And 
the one thing I remember from my experience at church that still has a lasting effect. It wasn't necessarily like they, they went over some story of Moses sure, and everything sure. and like all of that, all of the readings, mm-hmm. none of that really stuck out to me very much. But the main thing that stuck out to me and provides me with lasting like joy and just something to to think about when mm-hmm. I'm alone is you had a huge group of people that were all celebrating something bigger than themselves. Mm-hmm. And I feel like my entire life, and a lot of viewers, I'm sure you guys can attest to this, you grow and you live in a hyper-individualized society where everyone is solely focused on themselves. But finally, when you have a group of people that do something on behalf of someone else Mm -hmm. or for some other purpose, for some reason, that just feels good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably why a lot of people, when they have kids, it's like the most joyous and fulfillment and just like provides a purpose for you Mm -hmm. greater than yourself. I've taken a lot of flack for that on the... the, uh with the internet's folks, right? Um, I didn't know what I didn't know until I held a kid. I thought I knew what love was. I was incredibly in love with my wife. I was incredibly in love with my life. I was incredibly in love with my faith and my, I didn't understand it though, right? And like a, it, it was so shape-shifting for me that I was scared to have a second kid because I was afraid I wouldn't there's no way I could love like this. And I didn't realize there's just another chamber opens up, right? And it's like, no, no, you can go, like, love's bigger. The challenge is you can't ROI it on the front end. Like, you can't, like, the math doesn't work, right? Oh, you're going to lose all your money. You're going to lose all your time. You're going to lose all the stuff. And so, and the challenge with having a kid is you don't, you, you can't be like, all right, I'm going to trade that fund, all right? That was a bad mutual fund. You can't, you're stuck with it. Um, I had one, it was a monk I spent two years with. He's, he's amazing. He was a bioethics professor and he'd leave in the summer and go live in a monastery. He's an amazing man. But he said, that's why you have mentors ahead of you. For when you are swinging on a vine through the jungle and your vine runs out and you let go and you don't see the other vine coming, but you do see those guys up there, those men and women up there that have gone before you. And you realize, okay, it's coming and you're just free falling and you're like, oh God. So I, to me, that's what the path is. I do think you're exactly right. It's every, all of it is based on ROI and what about you and what about you and what about you and how do you protect you? And I think we are missing oxygen when we do that. It's like breathing through a, breathing through a, a, you know, a piece of cloth and you just miss all that air. Let me ask you this. Why, what, what has been the, 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 about going into a church? Or it just never occurred to you? I, it, it's never occurred to me. My mom, she grew up Jewish. My yeah. father grew up Christian. Okay. And it, it just never, like they stopped being religious when yeah. they got together. And I've never really had experience. And I'm sure- mm-hmm. Grandma, Mine is the same. My mom grew up Jewish. Uh-huh. Yeah. I grew up Christian. But same, I'm sure same, same you thing. didn't grow yeah. up with any like religious principles, values. No. Did you ever attend church or anything or no. mass? No. Mm-hmm. So like there's some weird generation, I think, that like for some reason it's fading out. Maybe there's just distractions and technology. Who knows what sure. it is? I'm sure we could probably trace it to something eventually. Uh, but yeah, people- I do see a lot of people becoming less and less religious, mm-hmm. but I also notice a concentration of the happiest, most productive and positive people, at mm-hmm. least in my experience. This is right. purely anecdotal. Mm-hmm. They happen to be religious. That is yeah, just a coincidence. I, 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 as a guy who's gone to church my whole life and a person of faith, I think I've got to wear that blame. I think on, on a large scale, churches got really interested in fighting other churches instead of feeding hungry people and taking care of widows instead of putting the government out of business with caring for the least of these we got mad at each other about who said what and how and i think it's been a wild distraction and for a younger generation of people who watch their parents just fight and be angry and be upset all the time and watching rage news all the time i don't want that right i don't i don't want to be a part of that and so it 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 it's just easy a plus b equals c when it terms like you have a whole generation of people being like i'm not gonna do that i'm gonna go lift weights right i'm not gonna do that i'm gonna I'm going to make an incredible, beautiful fish tank. I'm going to, I'm going to put my energy in making money, right? Because I know how that works. I totally get that. It's so funny because a lot of the things that we're discussing are so controversial. Pro-church, anti-church, mental health, drugs, prescriptions, Mm -hmm. not prescriptions, people's personal experiences, people's interpretation of data, what the data Mm -hmm. actually says. All of this stuff is so controversial. And I know for a fact people are going to leave so many different hate comments. I don't feel like it is. Yes, a hundred percent. This is so Mm -hmm. controversial. And for those of you that want to leave these comments, let's do it in an instructive or a constructive way. And let's have fantastic conversations in the comments. Mm-hmm. I'm very excited to see what the pro and con uh, side of the arguments are for all of these different mm-hmm. things. So that is a formal invitation. Well, in the I appreciate section. that. I, I mentioned on a show and then the person who cuts my show into tiny little clips and puts it on social media. Um, 
I posted something. I was talking to a mom who called into the show and she was just talking about, she's kind of in a desperate moment. Like we're spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars we don't have on travel sports. And I said, as a guy who played the early iterations of travel sports, I ran track in college for a year. Like, I get it. My whole life has been athletics. And then I was a coach for my first job at high school. Um, I mean, out of college. I love sports. I'm all about it. And the the statement I made was um, travel sports are destroying American families with money, time. They've made the kids the epicenter of this home. And a kid can't bear that weight. That's not the kid's job. And it's not the parent's job to do whatever the kid wants all the time. My kids want to eat ice cream and eat Twinkies 24 seven, man. It's my job to not do that. Right. To regardless of what they want, that's part of being a parent. The comments were so, um, it was wild. Like Mark Cuban reached like those who live really? in, in sports know that the data's on my side. I'm right. And my buddies who are, uh, collegiate, uh, trainers are telling me, dude, we're seeing 18 year olds with joint overuse injuries that you see in the elderly because they've been, a pitcher since they were six and they did baseball in the fall and the winter and the spring and the summer and they had pitching like wildness you know michael jordan was famous for putting a basketball down at the end of the season and not picking up a ball until the seat the preseason started again he played golf he played baseball he went ran, running he did other things which is great for your body all i have to say is the comments were so individualistic for me and my family this was best don't ever say this again you take this down and so I think when you're talking about religion, when you're talking about medication, when you're talking about these things that are highly personal, either you got hurt real bad or they saved your life or your marriage was falling apart and you had a kid who was good at baseball and it brought your family back together. Amazing. But I think it's important to not take your personal experience and cast it on everybody and say, this is the truth. It's an experience you had. And I'm, that's amazing. That's awesome. Talk about your experience versus this is just the way all churches are bad. No, there was a a guy at your church that's evil and hope that dude's in jail. Although, you know what? Before we go into that, if you're running a business, there is no better sound than hearing. And if you want to hear a lot more often, then it's time to get started with our sponsor, Shopify. For those unaware, Shopify is the global e-commerce platform that's already helped transform millions of businesses worldwide. For example, Shopify is an endless list of integrations, third-party apps, and flexible templates to customize your store exactly the way you want to. And what really sets Shopify apart from their competitors is their ability to turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout that's 36% better on average than other leading competitors. Not to mention, Graham, Shopify actually powers 10 10% of all e-commerce in the United States, supporting brands like Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklyn in over 175 countries. In fact, my coffee company, bankrollcoffee.com, is run exclusively through Shopify. And when we were first starting out, Shopify was that good that we didn't even want to go anywhere else. Plus, they have an award-winning support team that's there to help you every step of the way. So sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash ICH, all lowercase. Change your life with $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash ICH. Shopify.com slash ICH with the link down below in the description. Thank you so much. And now let's get back to the podcast. So staying on the topic of controversy. Oh, good. There, <laughs> there was a very popular tweet that happened. This was probably a couple of months ago. Someone was basically providing a lot of reasons why therapy is not a good idea yeah. Yeah. and why it hurts people, right? Right. And obviously, I'm sure this person would not argue that therapy is bad for everyone, right. but a lot of the times it's used as a weapon and it can become like a plague in your sure. body as therapy. Some of the arguments they made was a lot of people treat whatever their therapist is saying as dogma mm -hmm. and they listen as though it is like, you know, undeniable truth and they right. think that's an issue another argument was that they equate going to therapy as being a good person and doing the right thing when most of what mm -hmm. is needed is actually done outside of therapy rather than in therapy I so they're like okay i checked that box mm -hmm. i made progress on whatever issues that i'm suffering from right now and then they go back to therapy next week and they kind of just forget about it in the meantime and it doesn't actually attack the problem because they think they are so here's what i would say to that one is there's some excellent points made no question about it i think the mental health community of which i'm a part of we have told people for 150 years that mental health is all the right thoughts in the right order and I think we have largely thrown out, especially in the last 20 years, um, you have to go do differently. You have to act differently. You have to change the things that you do on a daily basis. You can't just think your way into being healthy. You have to change how you live. If the, the thing you do to work on your mental health is an hour a week, we talk about this in church all the time. 
if your commitment to your faith is one hour a week on a Sunday with a donut and a cup of coffee, that's not a faith practice, right? That's, it, it should infuse how you live. Similarly, same with mental health challenges or emotional health challenges. And so there was some critique that was right on. My concern with it is, and it's a, this, the culture rewards sensation and the culture rewards dogma and opposite dogma, right? My challenge with it is, it's similar to if you were struggling with alcohol, if I come in and get rid of all the alcohol and you don't have a, I don't have a plan to help you get to AA. I don't have a plan to have a medical provider here to help you detox. I don't have these other things. I'm afraid that there's going to be a swath of people that pull their kids out of counseling and the kid has no other resource in the world. You got two busy parents who are looking for ways to cut costs and all of a sudden this person comes out and goes, therapy is kind of ridiculous for certain kids. Well, sweet. Now I'm not taking my kid. Now, now that kid's got nobody. Anytime somebody just takes their arm and wipes off a table and is like, this is all stupid. I want everybody to pause um, because sometimes it got that way because the systems in the weren't set up right. Do you think everyone should try therapy at some point? Or do you think there should be an issue to go and to specifically work on? Man, that's a great question. I'm just going to go with my gut on this one. Yeah. Is that okay? I have a rule that if I ask to, I'm asked a great question and I don't have like a formulaic response, I'm just going to go with what I think is true in the moment. I think most people need a group of really close friends that they can lean on and talk to and that will show up with food when they're hurting, will sit with them and say, yeah, me too. We don't have that. We just don't have it. It's gone from our culture. And so if you don't have that, then yes, having a neutral third party that you can talk to and do life with, even if you have to pay for it, is critical to survival, right? You need a therapist the same as you need like a joint reconstruction. But do you person. worry that those people maybe have an interest or might be biased for you to do one thing over another versus a therapist who would be, assuming they're qualified, of course, good, of course. that would be a total neutral third party. I know some people who are close mm -hmm. will say that they know what's best for you. Mm -hmm. But then maybe sometimes people say, you know, let's just say you're having a relationship problem, but your friend hates your boyfriend. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. you guys break up. Mm -hmm. It's a piece of shit. You yeah. know? Versus a therapist looking at the situation and saying, hey, well, maybe it's this and maybe this and you mm -hmm. should reconsider these things. Well, a therapist might say, Every time you talk about your boyfriend, you light up. Sure. And every time you talk about your boyfriend, your shoulders drop and you relax. Let's talk about your roommate. How's that relationship? Right. And then you're like, well, my roommate said, right. And so a good therapist is going to watch the lang, like, you know, behaviors of language, like your body, like, tell me about this stuff. And I'll also say, man, if your closest three or four or five friends are all telling you the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Recently, my manager, Cody, he, yeah. he was like, I don't know what's going on in your life, dude, but like, you're not being your normal self. And you're being a jerk to be around. You're complaining about everything. And I literally, he's younger than me. And I was like, whatever, wait till you grow up and have, right? Yeah. Well, then a week later, my wife was like, hey, man, can we talk? She's like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and I was like, okay, now I trust Cody with my business. I trust that guy as a yeah. friend, as a business partner. I trust my wife with it, my life, with everything. All right. Now I've got two data points. It's probably me. Right. I need to go to the, mm -hmm. I need to go to the mirror. And that's just not having any ego in it. I want to be well and whole. Right. I think it's why you have close people. Final controversial talking point. Sweet. Is anxiety all logical anxiety, aka caused by lack of working out, poor work-life balance, no support systems, etc.? Or is there a true like genetic anxiety disorder that gets passed on? Here's the way I explain genetics and anxiety. Um, the three of us all have our own house. And in that house, every house has a basement. And in my basement, I do motorcycle repair. And in your basement, you make candles. And in your basement, Jack, because you were doing this earlier, you just have a yoga studio and you just do yoga all the time. And let's say that house catches fire. All of our houses catch fire. My house is full of lubricants, flammable things, lubricants, oil, gas, and my house will explode. Your house would smell really good when it burned to the ground because it's full of all these fragrance, fragrances, right? And yours would just gently settle into ash. That's genetics. The fire is the important thing here, right? And so some people like me are more bent towards a more anxious response to things. Some people, my son, for instance, when things get wild, he gets real slow. It's amazing to watch. He's going to have to just keep an eye out in life when he gets hit, when he gets fired, when somebody breaks his heart, that his 
his body might lean towards just shutting the door and isolating. Everybody acts, everybody responds def- different. That's why the, the genetic argument isn't as important as what's your body trying to do to keep you safe? And then what are you doing to stay healthy? At 26, I was hired as an associate dean of students at a university, way over my head, way over my head. And within a few years, it was like, man, you're going to be a college president someday. And I was like, that's right. You know what I mean? I raced through, got a PhD, thought I was all smart. I was real, I was an arrogant idiot. Like, you're going to be a college president. You're going to be a college president one day. You're going to be a college president one day. Good at speaking, right? And then I spent the next decade working with college presidents. And I realized I don't want that life. The closer I got, the more budget responsibilities I had, the more personnel issues, the more I would get more anxious and more anxious. And I had to look in the mirror and say, this may not be the job for me. Or I'm going to have to hire this job very different, right? I didn't want to deal with my limitation of, man, I can do this job. It's going to cost me a lot. And we don't like that. We don't like the other side of the cost equation in our culture. We just want to head forward. We don't want a social media where some guy says, I think travel sports are killing you. And somebody goes, well, not in my house. You shouldn't say that, right? Instead of going, hmm, my house, they were great. And I'm on to the next post. We don't like that, man. We don't like the other side of that that equation. That makes sense? That does. Yeah, I really liked that that house analogy. How everyone's predisposed to respond slightly differently to different stimulus. Right. How do people know that? Is it just intuitive at that point that they know I react like this and therefore I should do this? I'm not good enough to parse that out of myself. Okay. When I get emotional or I get responding to things or reactive, man, I'm not learning. I'm not thinking very clearly. Um, that's why you need a community of people. That's why you need a therapist. That's why you need somebody to go. Every time you talk about this, you get real short of breath. Or like my wife, I uh, say like, hey, dude, I'm gonna write another book. She's like, you're tough to be around when you write because you we, we lose you for nine months. Even when you're walking around the house, you're not with us. You're in, you're in the cloud somewhere. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm present with the family. And she's like, I promise you're right. And she's exactly right. Yeah. And so um, I think you have people around you that hold a mirror up for you. It's a gift. One of the most fascinating things from our discussions that always sticks with me is some of the crisis stories, because that is so different than anything 99% of people experience in their day to day. Mm -hmm. And what you've gone through and what you've seen people gone, uh, have what they've gone through is just, I feel like it it would bear so much trauma Mm. and make such a, a strong impact. Why do you think you are perfectly fit for that position and what type of person is i can only tell you my experience it's been my experience that somebody sees a dead body and somebody naturally leans in or somebody naturally turns away and i'm sure there's more to it than that that's just been my experience and the first time i showed up to a scene it was how can i help right it was a leaning into it And I remember the first time I helped a policeman clean brains off of a bathroom wall before a mom got home to see that her kid had died by suicide. I called my dad and it was late and he was a homicide detective for years. And I was like, hey, this just happened. And his first words out of his mouth were, you should not have seen that. I was like, I know, it was tough. And we talked through it and I had an amazing supervisor. So I don't know that I'm perfectly suited for it other than when things get super chaotic. Um, In that moment, I get real still and some people do and some people don't. I get real anxious afterwards. It's when I'm laying in bed at night going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. But in the, in the moment, it just it just is what it is. I don't know if that's training. I don't know if that's over and over and over again. I don't know what that is. But Which crisis had the largest effect on you? Maybe one you still think about to this day, even though it occurred years ago. I was in a, at a university where there's an active shooter and um, that, was a, that was a trying, scary situation. Uh, My students were hiding and um, I was a safe voice for them and they didn't come out. And it wasn't until everybody got the all clear that students were coming out of every nook and cranny. It hit me like I was in such protection mode, right? Take care of everybody mode that it was it was pretty terrifying. And it wasn't in our particular building. We were on a university campus um, and I actually got the call and went to the building because I knew my students, my law students would be there late. But it was a harrowing deal. I remember texting my the supervisor saying, hey, where's this guy? And I thought I thought they'd had him by now, the shooter. And the text I got back was something to the effect of all caps. This is this situation's live. And I was like, oh, man. Like it, it was, that was, that haunts me. When you get those thoughts in your head and you're still thinking about it, what do those thoughts look like? I call them lightning bolts. 
there's moments like there's, and it happens to all of us, right? But there's um, an image of a mom busting through a door when she got a call that her child was dead, right? She's coming in. Or a, a mom hugs you in a certain way when their child is dead. It's a different hug. It's a, it's a, um, it's a hug of desperation as though someone's about to fall off a bridge. That's how they, they hold you in a really tight all body way. And it's very unique to that, that situation. Um, those, they, that pops into your head. And I think what was revolutionary for me, it's a great David Kessler. He's the world's grief expert. In my opinion, he's the one that really hammered home for me. Um, his book, um, finding meaning is a grief masterpiece, but talks about in that moment, you have a choice, right? Parents who bury their child, and they that casket closes. That image will pop into your head. Twenty years later, you have a moment. You you have a choice when that moment happens. Am I going to meditate on that and go down that rabbit hole? And your body will respond. Somebody cheats on you, and you have an image of her or him with somebody else that you can't control. That it pops into your head. What you can control is: Am I going to dwell on that and think about that, or you see the little ticker tape? U.S. economy about to go into a free fall. You can go down a rabbit hole or you can think, no, it's not. I know the principles or it is and I'm protected, right? It's the decision. Am I going to meditate on those things? For me, there's a constant refrain. I wasn't safe then, but I'm safe now. Does that change your belief on human nature to see so much destruction and negativity? No, because it's always surrounded by infinitely more compassion and joy and people showing up to help. In fact, it's always a... Another one that haunts me is showing up to a scene where um, I think he was 19 or 20, uh, maybe 21 year old young man had died um, by suicide. And he took such amazing care so that those who loved him, who were going to come have to deal with what, the aftermath, would have so little mess to deal with. And I thought, my God, if you could only see how much you actually love the people around you. And in turn, were able to re receive how much they loved you. The person was so careful and kind and thoughtful about how they were going to pass. And they weren't able to see, you're not a burden, right? You are actually loved that much too. And so those haunt me, right? But there's so much compassion and so much love that shows up after those situations often that it's, it's overwhelming. Do you think it's healthy to be exposed to those sort of tragedies? It has been for me. I think the culturally, culturally we have a, a problem. And I think, um, I think pornography is similar is you've got young people that have or 19 or 20 have never held hands with somebody, but they've seen 10,000 hardcore sexual acts. There's a distortion between what your body experiences when you waste a whole movie just trying to like get your finger next to somebody's mm -hmm. finger to see if we're going to hold hands or not. And then just having your whole hedonic sensor blown with, you know, going to the wrong website. Similarly with death, I think we've seen 8 million John Wick killings. And our parents didn't let us go to our granddad's funeral because they didn't want to scare us, right? So we've never been in a room with a dead body. We've never been at a, at, at a collective grief moment. We just watch it on the news and watch it on the news and watch it on the news. And so, yeah, I think the exposure, I think I always tell people, take your kids to a funeral. Um, kids need to be a part of that and feel that and see that because what they learn from that is, this is scary and terrifying and awful. And the adults are crying. Then the adults go to dinner. And then the adults go to bed and the adults wake up. And so together we can get through this. Have you ever not known what to do in a crisis? Maybe you showed up and you were just completely stumped mm -hmm. by it. And, and, and what did that look like? In my world, back when I was, like when I was doing patrol work, it, you always have a partner. There was two situations where um, in my house, we went through three miscarriages and the third one was an ectopic pregnancy and um, it ruptured and almost killed my wife. And then all of a sudden she got pregnant a fourth time and that's my daughter now. I walked into a scene and it was a mother explaining, um, it was a really gruesome, caustic situation, but she was explaining to her four or five kids that dad had died by suicide that day in a really awful way. And I walked in and there was little kids playing and that was the first time in my whole life, my body said, get out of this room. And I didn't, I was like, no, I'm, st I'm good. It's like, get out of this room. And I told my partner, I got to go. And her name's Janice. She's amazing. She was like, you can't leave. And I was like, I have to leave. And then out in the parking lot, she said, I never seen you like this. You go home. All right. And then a few weeks later, I showed up to another scene and it was a hospital and um, two uh, 
two daycare workers had taken a van full of infants and had gone to do something and taken them back to the daycare center and left two of the infants in the very, very back seat in 100 degree weather. And I showed up to a 19 year old mom and a 19 year old dad and an infant that was probably not going to make it. And again, my body was like, I had an infant at home. My body's like, get out of this house, get out of this hospital. And so um, I then, it's my job to tell my supervisor, I can't do any more baby calls for a while. And now I could go back and do them. But at the time I had an infant at home, I experienced a lot of loss of my own at, at the house. And so A, you always go with somebody else, go with a partner and B, don't be afraid to say, I can't. I can't right now. Unless you're in the military on a mission or you're a police officer and you're responding to save someone's life, just the, the bravest thing you can do often is say, me being here is going to cause more problem to the situation that's going to help. And this skill that you have to bring people off of a ledge, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term, have you ever employed that in a situation that wasn't necessarily a call? Maybe you're like at the grocery store or something and you see something. Oh, like, always. Yeah. But so I mean, but I mean, it's not, I, I think we... The training is really human 101, right? Like showing up and showing somebody that I hear you and that I see you. And can you hear me? It goes back to counting um, cracks in the sidewalk and counting trees. What I'm doing when I do that, somebody as simple as I, I drove up to work, this is about two years ago, and there was a small car and there was like eight bodies leaning into this car. And so I just knew something's going on in that car. And I parked and ran over to the car and somebody was having a panic attack in the car. And I asked everybody to back up because the worst thing when someone's having a panic attack is having nine faces in your face, right? And I asked the woman who's having a, she couldn't breathe. And I said, will you hold my hand? And she said, yeah. And I said, will you get out of the car? She said, yeah. She got out. And I said, this is going to be weird, but will you take your hand and put it on my chest for a second? And she goes, yeah. And we walked around the parking lot. And within just a few minutes, it was whoosh. And then she get embarrassed. I was like, don't be embarrassed. Like your body is trying to keep you safe. It took off on you. But that counting is telling your body Get out of your fight or flight. Get out of your reactive. We're here and we're okay, right? And so I think that helps if somebody spun up at a grocery store. I don't know why that guy's so mad. I'm not going to fight you, right? I don't know why you're so mad. You're not going to talk to her like that. How can we solve, like, what's, how can we solve this? Oh, that guy cut in line? Well, let's deal with that, right? And it's just a matter of bringing a room down. But that's a, when you show up to somebody and they're, they've crossed a line and they think the world will be a better place and they'll stop hurting, by not being here anymore, getting through that reaction system and saying, no, 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 I see you. The world's not going to be better without you here. That's just, that's human one-on-one, man. You tell a story quite often about how your daughter would not hug you. Oof. Yeah. Um, man, you guys did your homework. Good for you. Um, I think I've only told that like on two or three different shows. That's good for you guys. Um, yeah, it started out as kind of a funny thing. My older son, um, he's 14 now, is very, like, very compassionate, very, like, touches, touches an important thing for him. And my daughter wasn't. And I did not understand how therapeutic and healing a hug from a daughter is. And I've talked to other dads of daughters and I'm like, bro, it's wild, right? And also, it's not my daughter's job to heal me. Right. So it's that weird. I love it. And you feel better when your daughter's like, daddy and runs and hugs you. And also it's not her job to make me feel better. That's my job. Right. And so it started out as kind of a funny thing. It's kind of a tension thing. And she'd be like, no, dad. And she'd run away. And it was kind of part of our game. But I didn't like that game. Right. And long story short, it built up and built up and built up to where. I knew something wasn't right developmentally. This is this got it got weird. Right. And I know enough about child psychology to know something's not healthy here. And it was my wife, who's brilliant, was Dr. Deloney way before I was. She's the OG. She said, you know, you're always talking about neuroception, right? This, I, this, this radar that is scanning the environment 24-7 for threats, for things that aren't okay. What if her teeny tiny little girl, six-year-old girl body has identified you as not safe? And I was like, that's insane. I don't ever yell in my house. I don't swear at my kids, right? I don't, um, I don't hit my kids. Like, there's nothing to be scared of. And that's when my wife said, oh, John, you've got a nuclear reactor in your chest. Like all of us can feel it, right? I was like, what are you, I think my response was like, what are you talking about, right? Um, but I called BS. I was like, no, I don't. I don't have a nuclear reactor. I'm like a nice guy. And she's like, you're a controlled guy. I'm like, it's there. So I was like, whatever, dude. So I went to someone in, in Nashville who is a, like probably the best, 
therapist psychologist I've ever met. And I plopped down and was like, I've got a nuclear reactor in my chest. And that ended months later with me saying some things out loud that had happened when I was a kid that I didn't tell my wife. I've been with my wife for a quarter century. She didn't know. I just never told anybody. And I didn't understand um, the way I will all I like to teach about traumas. Your body just puts little GPS pins and things that happen when you're a kid. Good stuff, bad stuff. And when it starts to detect we're getting near that GPS pin again, it will sound the it'll sound the alarms, man. Your job is to keep you safe. And so my body had was tough to be around. And after after months of that, dude, it was the way the quote unquote story ends, which is not an ending. She's eight now and it's amazing. But I was doing something on on the ground. I was trying to get something out from under a chair or something, but I was on all fours. And she just bombed me, jumped off something, grabbed me really tight and wouldn't get off. And I said a sentence out loud. I said, Josephine, get off me. And then I started laughing and I was like, no, don't get off me. Right, right. And I realized, oh, we hug all the time. Like She's running and jumping and climbing all over me. And it was this, I'm safe, right? And people at work noticed like, are you cool, man? Like you seem super chill. And it was just this letting go, man. So when you say you had a nuclear reactor in mm -hmm. your chest, what does that mean? Like you were just high strung? I think it was, my wife calls it, used to call it Sunday afternoon dad or a sleeping bear. Like a Sunday afternoon dad. Everybody knows dad's on the couch. He's kind of half asleep. There's a ball game on. Everybody in the house kind of knows don't go in there. Don't go wake up dad. Right? You know what I mean? Every And uh, when I say that, most people are like, I was, I'm my dad. Right? It's just that sense that in that room, it's not okay. And I didn't want to be Sunday afternoon dad, so I didn't go turn the ball game on. In fact, it was probably worse. I just plopped in the middle of everybody, but I was still that Sunday afternoon dad. I still was that bear. And so I think it's a body that's just waiting for the next thing, right? Always waiting for the next thing. And if trauma happens to you when you're a little kid, you're always waiting for the next thing. You're always waiting for the next thing to come. And other people pick up on that. And it comes across as guy's an ass. That guy's a jerk. That guy's high strung. He was always reactive. But man, that challenge is way, way, way upstream. This is a very specific question. And if you don't want to answer, we can always get yeah, yeah, this yeah, out. Yeah. But you had a call mm -hmm. on the show that I did hours of research into. Wow. And I tried cool. I to, to I find that updates Good. i tried so hard to find like i was in reddit threads like, <laughs> like old it was bad like okay. old face like you name it i yeah. was there i'm just i don't want to say too much because yeah. i don't want people to do it but it was a call and it was a father that was calling about four weeks after something catastrophic had happened okay. in his house he had two kids mm -hmm. two sons that went and planned to kill the mother so his wife mm. as well as his younger son. Ooh, this is early, early on, huh? I like looked up court records. I looked up everything. Mm. I could not find updates to this very specific call. And it is so fascinating because this guy, this father was a victim as well as someone who was a father to, you know, two kids that had gone on right. attempted murder. Do you know anything that happened in this case. And then I found there are so many people that are curious too. The only thing I don't like about my show is I'm always asking people, will you call me back? 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 We've never staged a single call ever. And I always am like, okay, what happened? What happened? What happened? Very few people circle back. They just are embarrassed or they get blown up or it's, we have had people reach out and be like, whoa, somebody at my church recognized my voice, even though I changed the state and changed the name. And mm -hmm. like, can you take it down? Right. That call, um, and if I remember correctly, it's a dad with three kids and a wife has four kids, four kids. Two of the kids are like, let's kill mom. They go to kill mom and little brothers there or something like that. Yes. And so it gets some, somehow gets hurt or whatever it's too. Hit with a baseball bat. That's a sensational call that will happen to almost none of us. Right. All parents go through a thing where one of their kids does a thing and you find yourself not liking that kid. And you have another kid that's getting straight A's. You have one kid that's causing problems. And so I love the fact very few people will get 23 and me and find out their dad was the local priest and they kept it. The priest and their mom kept it a secret for all these years. That will happen to almost nobody. But the number of people who reach out to the show and say, dude, I did 23 and me and found out 
my dad's got, I got kids, I got brothers and sisters that I didn't know about. Like I got, like that's pretty common. Or more importantly, what do you find out? What happens when you find out your dad's not who he thought you, who you thought he was? He had a secret, his own secret pornography addiction. He had a big gambling addiction. He didn't have any retirement at all, or he had $5 million you didn't know about, right? I think the universality that's inside those sensational calls. I love it when people reach out and be like, I saw the title and I was like, that's not going to apply to me. And suddenly they're calling their husband and being like, I'm so sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not cheating on you with nine guys, including your best man, but I'm about to cross a line with somebody at work and we need to talk. Right. And I love that they're able to find their story in these big sensational stories. Recently, somebody called and as we dug into it, they called for one thing. And I remember getting real still. I was like, do you have a plan to take your life? And he said, yeah, I do. And just so happens, I do work with um, behind closed doors with um, a behavioral services team in the state where this guy lived. And I said, if I get you connected to an inpatient group today, will you go? I said, you got to go. And if you don't, I'm going to call 911. I'm not giving you an option. You're, go you're going somewhere today. And he said, yeah, I'll go. How do you, how do you deal with uh, publishing calls like that that mm -hmm. could open them up to a lot of negative comments. Like, let's just say someone's on the edge. Maybe they're just mentally depressed. Maybe they're going through some stuff, but to put their call online and then have them potentially read the comments about them mm -hmm. and have those comments just be nasty. Well, in this particular case, yeah. the guy did, we, we'll always tell him, don't read the comments. Like they're, don't read them. Like this is, you and I had a human experience as much as we could on the phone. Don't read the comments. Um, people don't understand what you're going through. I don't fully know your story. I got nine minutes yeah. with you. But are right? people really going to listen? I mean, some, some people do will, some don't. but I feel like it's a morbid curiosity. People like seeing a, know, yeah. you know, a car crash where it's like, don't look, but, but I gotta everyone look. looks. This particular story that I just yeah. told you, the guy reached out and the comments were so beautiful and so amazing. And he said, I've not felt this loved in a long time. Hmm. And so it, it worked the other way this time. Okay. But do you ever come into situations I always people, tell people don't look at I mean okay. don't yeah I mean and, and the the request to have their show taken down has gone way down but early on especially people would ask like whoa I gave my name and my my yeah. place I didn't know my husband listened to the show he just came home and was upset and so that, that yeah, does I'm happen I'm how often that happens because it seems like you could change a name we change names and location, and location but almost like, all the time hypothet if Jack were to call in and I listen I would know it's oh. Jack complaining <laughs> about Graham <laughs> yeah. I work my, with this guy my business partner he's the worst high profile finance YouTuber <laughs> 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 yeah, you have my, hot gram, but my yeah. name is Whack from <laughs> Vos Ligas, and uh, no, it, um, it. I mean, it happens. I don't know how much we, we've kind of we prep people on the front end yeah. enough to say we're not going to take it down. Um, I I think we've taken on a few, and they were pretty pretty dire situations. Okay. So on your channel, your most successful videos tend to be relationship based. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it is that most relationships are failing? Um, I'll, people are unhappy in those relationships. Yeah. I'll echo yeah. William Glasser. Um, he's a famous psychiatrist from the day that, that kind of swore off psychiatry, but he said he could fix marriage relationships in one or two sessions. And we kind of said it flippantly. And I remember yeah. in grad school, I was like, who does this guy think he is? And here's what he said. He said, we think in pictures, but we speak in words. And if you can align the pictures, you can get people aligned. And so the, the, the analogy I made up about that is if my wife comes to me and is like, hey, um, you and me, Friday night, hottest date of your life. Let's do this. And then she kind of winks and flirtatiously and walks away. Dude, Monday night, I'm thinking about this date. Tuesday, I'm wondering like what I'm going to be wearing and for how long, what she going to be wearing. By Thursday, I'm wondering like where the helicopter is going to land, all that stuff. And then Friday, I go home from work. I shower. I put on a suit. I get all gussied up. And I walk out and she's in running shorts and a t-shirt. And I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, what are you doing? I said, you said we're going on a hot date. And she's like, yeah, dude, it's seven tacos for $7 at the taco hut, right? Um, and then I get mad and then she gets mad that I'm mad. And we both said date and I had a picture that looked like this and she had a picture that looked like that. And so I think most people in relationship, you hire Jack. Like, I want you to be the co-host. Your job is to kind of be cool, but ask the hard questions, be way better looking, have amazing hair. Thank right. You. Uh, Great. <laughs> um, but you have a picture of what this, what he's going to be doing yeah. and he shows up. And his picture of what you told him is just different because y'all both said co-host and he had a picture of co-host. And I think we need to do a better job of saying, 
here's um, here's what I have in mind. Here's what this looks like. Even when my kid, I, I remember telling my seven or eight year old, my son, when he was young, he would kept talking and talking over some adults. And I said, hey, will you be cool? And then I just started laughing. I was like, yeah, you don't really know what that means because you're eight, right? Here's what this means. All right. And so we just launch words at each other. Make sure you vote right. Well, I got a picture of what that looks like and you do too. And now I find out you voted the wrong way and now we're fighting and we just got to align the pictures. And then if we have a true disagreement, then we'll have that disagreement. But most of us don't. How much do you think current culture uh, going online and society is affecting relationships today? No, it's destroying it. In what way? Well, have you ever had a fleeting thought about somebody you dated or somebody you had a crush on when you were in middle school? And you're like, no, I never, no. No, never had a crush. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for all of human history, you wonder like what happened to so-and-so? Well, now I can just pull out my phone and find out. And then I can reach out to her and say, how's it going? Here's my cell number. Give me a call. And now we're off to the races, right? So we've injected these things that have never happened before in human history. And we also, man, I don't, we don't have the psychological capacity to deal with every tragedy going on every corner of the world all at the same time. And we're considered cruel and not compassionate if we're not up to the minute on every tragedy going on. We, we, can't, we can't hold all of that. So it makes it very hard to be present with somebody when you're just buried by the weight of the world. And There's what, something that you said that phrased that in a slightly different way that really resonated with me, which was like, would you let 7 billion people in your family room? Well, you do every, every morning day. at six in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. On your phone. Yeah. It's access to all of these other things that don't actually impact you, but they say that they do. Mm -hmm. There's a former Navy SEAL who recently said, uh, he, and he's a cyber guy. And he's like, man, when you give your kid a smartphone, you're not giving him the world. You're giving the world to him. Right. And a seven year old can't compute waking up in the morning and opening a phone and getting the opinions of 7 billion people and what he should be doing and why. And who might have said I'm any different? Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's too many voices, too much mess, too much chaos. We're not wired for it. So what do you think the biggest problems are in relationships? When people call in, mm -hmm. what's the issue? What's the most common problem that people say they have? Agency and boundaries. Um, last night, sitting at the table with a group of people who listened to the show, somebody didn't have the courage to tell their mom, I, I can't take care of you like this anymore. They don't know how to set a boundary. They don't have permission. They've been responsible for the parents emotions for so long and they don't know how to they don't know what to do next and most people have been told as we talked about earlier all you are is this or this or this and they don't understand that they can be so much more and they just need permission to leave they need permission to say you can't talk to me like that or you can't hit me anymore and most people don't don't know that they have that kind of agency and what about in romantic relationships oh man there's all kind Same. of problems with those yeah, yeah. but i mean it it, it, most it, it distills yeah. down so. to here's a conversation i had so um, back when I had a, a large staff, I invited the dean of the business college to come talk to my team. And his name was Dr. Lytle, brilliant guy. And he was a business professor and he was the dean of the business school. He comes in and begins to talk about his family's core values and their family strategic plan. And I rolled, I was like, oh, geez, this guy. Leave it to a business professor to ruin family too, right? And so I interjected and I said, you have a strategic plan for your family, like your wife and kids and stuff. And here's what he said. He goes, how long do we vision cast strategic plan, five-year plan, job descriptions for our jobs? And I remember he ended with this sentence for our businesses, for things that don't matter. And then we just go home and we just kind of do dad like our dads did, or we don't do dads like our dads did. And we kind of are married like our parents were married and we kind of just fall into what they did. And so I think the largest challenge to modern relationships is a lack of intentionality is this idea that I don't know how to do this. It's kind of like being on a plane a few times and being like, I can fly this. That's how we treat marriage. Like I've seen a marriage or two. I can do that. Right. And we don't, study it we don't research it we don't dig into it we don't figure it out we don't come up with practices we just like try to be married and then we say stupid stuff like well that marriage just ran its course no it didn't we just quit like y'all stopped and so i think people we're not we're not I'm, myself included we're just not intentional like we should be on something that matters this much a lot of people call into your show on the brink of divorce mm -hmm. why are most divorces initiated by women and what have you noticed to be the number one cause of this? It's a modern, it's a modern concept and it's, it's economic viability. 
for all of human history, women weren't allowed to work. My mom in 1970, when she married my dad, was not allowed to sign a mortgage in the United States. That's my mom. This isn't that long ago. Uh, my mom was not allowed to have a checking account without my dad's signature in 1970, right? I think it was 73 when that changed. And so for all human history, women were tied economically to the men in their lives. And now all of a sudden, six or seven out of 10 college graduates are women. Like they're, they're, they're crushing men in multiple categories. And so now they can't, don't have to put up with that crap anymore and they can leave. And so, yeah, when, as soon as when, when that happens, culture by culture by culture, um, Esther Perel's talked about that a lot. Like his cultures, as, as it begins to balance out, women are out, man, they leave because they can. I heard in a conversation between, I think it was you and Jordan Peterson, that women initiate the divorces because they're more likely to respond to negative stimuli. They're more likely to you know, talk about the the negativity to to bring that to discussion or whatever. Whereas guys are more so just like ah, it's, you know, whatever it doesn't just matter. A futility, right? And I, and I think that's a lack of tools. It's a lack lack of skills. Um, again, for all human history, men didn't have to be good at relationship. There was no such thing as no fault divorce. It just was right. And so I didn't have to learn this thing, and no one had to listen to her talk about the things that were burning up inside of her. It just was. And now all of a sudden men are being tasked with, Hey, y'all have to learn some new skills, man. It's a new time. I don't want to roll back um, women's contribution to the workforce and education, all these important places. But that means men have to learn new skills and men have to learn to say, don't just say the words. It is what it is. That's not a good answer. Or I guess whatever she, no, learn to say out loud. Here's what scares me. Here's what I want. Here's something I need. Say those things out loud. That's bravery and courage, not just, oh, whatever, dude. See, I heard that that women initiate more divorces on average. And I think it's so – it's almost like 50-50, but mm-hmm. it's like slightly skewed for the women in response to things the guys are doing. And so that could be like maybe the guy is cheating on her or maybe the guy is abusive or maybe this or that. So the guy's not initiating the divorce, but he is culpable for the divorce happening, if that makes sense. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, it doesn't, it, I mean, again, it goes yeah. back to they're initiating because they can now. Right. And in, for all human history, they couldn't. Right? And, they, and that wasn't a part of the deal. Why do people cheat in relationships? Hmm. How can you prevent your partner from cheating on you? Graham has a very interesting story about this. We were having this discussion right before the podcast. Okay. Do you want to say? Yeah, yeah, I'll say. So I was <clears throat> cheated on in a, in a prior relationship. Okay. But I told Jack. I don't see that as being like 100% her fault. Mm. I honestly think it was 50-50. Tell me about that. Like, I could have been a better partner. Okay. Um, we broke up initially mm-hmm. because I said, you know, I, I think we had dated for like almost a year. And I, th- I went to her and I said, I don't think you're the person I want to get married to. Mm-hmm. And obviously that was a huge shock. Mm-hmm. And so we broke up. But then we got back together afterwards. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, you know what? Like we did get along great and let's just see how it goes. But I think that that broke it so much that when she did it, like it wasn't a surprise to me, hmm. if that makes sense. So that's why I kind of think, I, yeah, I, it's, it's a 50-50. I'll lean on Esther Perel. This is kind of her world. But her explanation of a sense of aliveness or walking death, if you will. Um, and it, I'll, I'll walk you through how she got to it. And I love how she got to it. And it resonates a lot with me. She kept seeing over and over what you would call great marriages, Married, they get raising kids. They bury parents together. They like, she she held the house down when he went to law school, and now he's holding the fort down when she's going back to med school. Like, they did life together, and then one of them steps out, right? And it was often not because I didn't love you, and it was often not because our marriage wasn't f- going great or going. I wouldn't say great, going really good. It was this sense that I'm not. I'm dead inside. I'm al- I'm not alive anymore. It's this slow, quiet life of desperation. And then somebody at work thinks your jokes are hilarious and you feel that flame reignite just a little bit. Um, somebody writes you back. That was an amazing email. Keep those coming. And you start crafting your emails kind of with her in mind or him in mind. Right. And it's just a slow, you know, that you've heard that old, you just turn the wheel one degree and it turns all the way around. Suddenly somebody else makes you feel a little bit more alive. And so this stepping out of the marriage is about feeling alive again. And so um, you're in like, can we repair? 
can we find spark again? And are we committed? Um, I like what she says. Will you practice safety when you're dating? Are they going to answer the phone? Are they going to show up when they said they were going to show up? Is this person, how do they respond when they get, someone cuts them off in traffic? Does he freak out and smash the steering wheel or does he exhale and kind of laugh a little bit? You're practicing safety and safety can't, it, it, it can, but it's hard to coincide with desire right? It's that tension. I'm really attracted to this person. I'm all over them. I'm emotional, but we're practicing safety. Once you establish safety, that, that eros, that eroticism goes away. And so how do you practice desire over five, 10, 20, 30 years? It becomes, eh, we got along. That's cool. Let's give it a shot. I mean, that doesn't sound erotic. That doesn't sound like desire. That right, sounds like yeah. you're here. I'm here. Let's go get some D. Yeah. Right. But that's why I think the it's blame in aliveness. Is, yeah, yeah. Lot, not all the time, but in a lot of time, I think both parties usually have some responsibility. And usually I think cheating is in response to something in the relationships that's that's not working. And I, I would say ultimately it's one or both of us have agreed this is just the way this is gonna be. And we're not talking through seasons, we're not talking through what's coming up. We're not talking about how can I love you today. We're not talking about we're talking about I just got to do this and I got to do this. And you become great co-managers. You become great co-podcasters, right? And you stop saying like, why do we even get into this in the first place? And what is it about you that I just love? And um, here's something recently I did. And I don't think y'all know that I did this. Going back to what Dr. Lytle said, every year, my wife and I now do a strategic plan for our marriage. And we talk about our finances and we talk about love and we talk about how we're raising our kids. And we talk about all these goals that we had, how'd we do? This year, um, I spent some time in personal reflection and I went, huh. If you were to ask me, what are the two most important things in your life? I would say my wife and my two children, and I would say my faith. And then you would say, how much money have you spent over the years on mental health stuff? And I would say probably one hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy thousand dollars, including all my schooling and everything. And I haven't spent a penny on the other stuff. And I was like, man. So I hired a theology professor from a local university, and we meet once a week. And he's giving me a course. I said, I want you to design a course called Faith One Hundred and One for a semester for me. I'm to just go all the way back to zero. And I want to be able to tell my 14-year-old in very simplistic terms, here's why I believe what I believe. And then I asked my wife, I want a syllabus from you. She's an old professor. And I said, I don't know what podcast you listen to regularly. I don't know what songs you're listening to all the time in your headphones. I don't know what books you're reading that you really spark. I want you to make me a syllabus. And she said, this may be the most vulnerable, scary thing you've asked me to do. Because what if you don't like me at the end? I was like, I may think your books are terrible, but I'll like you. And so I'm committed this year to read these books that she outlined. I want to get to know my wife, not just like, where do you want to eat tonight or what color of your eyes? I want to know, here's what's been bringing you mystery and joy and laughter and fun, even if I disagree with it. I think that's a great entry point. That's fascinating. I heard on some podcast, <clears throat> you may know your kid likes reading a lot and you don't like reading. And they mm. read these like boring fiction things that you're not interested in whatsoever. You feel some sort of a disconnection with your kid. Mm. You can go and you can, what seems to be a waste of time and spend hours reading this book that they're so fascinated in and then surprise them with a question about mm. the book that only a reader would know. And this can like re-foster that, that connection. Yeah, so me and my son go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And it's tough sometimes when I get this really weird science fiction-y something or other, and I don't really understand dinosaurs and lasers or whatever. And I made him read The Comfort Crisis. He finished Jonathan Hyatt's book before I did. He grabbed The Anxious Generation, and I was like, okay, tell me all about it. And he goes, it's just what you've been telling me for years. I need, can't have a cell phone. I mean, he just kind of rattled it off. But um, he doesn't even know what he's absorbing. But more than that, he is absorbing my dad values me with his time. My dad read this book too, and I, I love that that interaction on the topic of keeping relationships going for yeah. an extended period of time. You talk about cultivating desire and safety. Mm -hmm. So like, those are two things that you juxtapose with one another. You say kind of crassly, but also honestly, it's like you go to the most safe person in your entire life. It's mm -hmm. like, no one wants to kiss their mom. No one right. wants to like make out with their mom, e even though that's kind of like a horrific sight. <laughs> and the fact that we're all kind of like mildly throwing up in our stomachs, think yeah, yeah. thinking about that, it's because they're the safest possible person. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of like, it's light on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. How can you make sure that you continue to balance desire as you keep a relationship going, because safety will usually be there if you spent enough time with someone, but how can you practice desire? I think people have to get to a place where they say out loud, here's what I want. And I hear the phrase a lot, my husband needs sex. And anytime somebody needs something energetically, that's a maternal response. Like my kids need food, my kids need clothing, 
And so if I'm married to somebody and I get home, I've worked a full day and my kids need this and this and this, and then my husband needs this and this, it goes on a checklist as a thing, a series of things to do. But if I get home and my husband wants me, my husband desires me and I get home and my wife desires me. That's another ball game. And so I always want to keep from slipping into that. You're my mom role. Going back to boundaries, going back to intentionality, man, the number of calls I get on my show and I'm like, dude, you're your husband's mom. It's, he's, he's a child for you. And she's like, oh my God. Yeah. Of course you don't have sex with your kid. But right. How do you differentiate that when let's say they have a traditional relationship where the mm-hmm. husband goes into work, sure. the wife cleans the house, mm-hmm. cooks the food. Isn't, aren't those just motherly tendencies to begin with, even though that's maybe more of a traditional gender role? It's a maternal energy to care, right. To, to take care of the home. Right. Um, and again, this is overly generalized. Everybody chill. It's cool. But like, um, yes, it's a maternal energy. Right. And. But there's a nurturing and then there is desire. Right. There is like this is my role here at the house. You go out and kill the animal and bring it home. I will cook it and prepare it. Right. We lump all that into make sex a chore. Right. Instead of making it a way that we come together and connect and we've also turned sex into every sexual encounter has to be a super bowl and when you're with somebody for a long time you're gonna have a bunch of like eh, that was that was, it was good it was fine we connected it was it was awesome it was it was yeah and then you'll have ones that are like that was a disaster right and if you're together on the same team and you're building something for the future you're able to laugh you're able to roll off you're like what happened there and then some are going to be spectacular but i think we're so feelings driven like that was a, it was a wild night or wasn't that great of a night. What happened? Right. But going back to what you said, like it goes back to the intentionality. Here's these, I got to get these tasks done. I got to get these tasks done above those and beneath those. I see you and I desire you. I want you versus I got another task on that list for you. Right. Does that ring true? Yeah. uh, But I guess why would, why are so many men undesirable? What do, what do they do to make themselves undesirable? I think for many women, uh, the man in their house is just another just another mouth to feed. Richard Reeves writes on this great in his book of boys and men. It's a masterpiece that men have cashed out. They've cashed out, man. Um, a lot of the traditional jobs are gone. A lot of the traditional roles are shifting and changing. They found themselves without skills. And that's why the Andrew Tates of the world are so popular because it's it gives somebody something to be angry at and to point and to flex on instead of saying, okay, I need to learn some new skills. But I think it largely men have been told you're the problem for everything in the world. Your jobs are slowly going away. You're not going to college. You're not get, guys aren't getting educated. They are, these programs don't work for men. And they're just kind of quitting. And so I think going back to your original divorce and economic, like women are like, dude, I'm out. I'm, I'm, I'm either out literally, I'm going to file or I'm out like this is whatever. Just another mouth in the house. That's fascinating. I think it was you that mentioned this or maybe it was someone else. They said, you ask like a man what his ideal day looks like barring maybe he having kids or something like that. And he just wants to sit on the couch and eat potato chips and watch the game. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like but, if you leave men like, to their own devices and provide them with everything, that's what they just want to do. I feel like the reason for that is because it's so opposite of what a lot of guys do on a daily basis, which is go and work a job they really don't like. Mm-hmm. They're expending a lot of energy at that. It could be physically demanding. So what's the opposite of that that they don't get to do often, which is watch TV, lay on the couch, mm-hmm. be uninterrupted and eat potato chips. I feel like if you do that, then – it might look different. But right? there's also like addictions, like you can get addicted to video mm-hmm. games and other True. things that are just yeah. so enticing that you just continue to do it all the time because you don't have these other responsibilities due to lack of skill or something like that. But you, I think what you just said is super key is we just give the first part of that equation that you laid out there as a given. It just is. You just go work a crappy job that you hate, that you don't want to be there at. And we just say that's the way that is. And I, I just wholeheartedly reject that. I think we create lives to where that's the only way we can keep our Lexus in the driveway and in our ex house and yada, yada, yada. So I have to go do this thing that's killing me. And the only way I can balance the teeter totter of my life is I go such a miserable path for most of the day that I just smash the other side of that teeter totter and I do nothing, which by the way, if it always sounds good, nobody feels better after doing nothing. You don't ever have nine hours on, on the couch, watching TV, eating potato chips and just getting up and be like that was awesome right no you feel worse and then you realize oh i gotta do this thing i'm late on this thing i should have got this report in and the whole loop starts again it's not settling for a 
And it's not, it's just rejecting the whole equation. To wrap up the conversation about cultivating desire mm-hmm. in long-term relationships, there was something uh, that you've quoted a lot of books. I'm going to quote a book mm-hmm. that I read in Stumbling on Happiness, which is the way that you can Love cultivate yeah, yeah. desire or make something good is two ways, scarcity and novelty. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say one guy goes and he deploys and then he comes back after six months. That Mm -hmm. first time seeing your wife again Mm -hmm. is gonna be amazing. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be so much desire and happiness and joy. But if you're with your wife eight hours a day, every single day, seeing them again, maybe after coming back from like a one day trip, it's just not very exciting, Mm -hmm. right? And then the other one, novelty, is like you can have, you know, a right balance of of scarcity or whatever. But if you do the same thing every single time, you're not going to be learning and adapting and growing with your wife. It's very hard to do the same thing. It becomes stale. To continue to date after you get married Mm -hmm. is a very important... I think it was you that actually said that. It's like a lot of people, they date, then they get married and they stop dating. The game's over. Yeah, Yeah, right. It's kind of like getting to the major leagues. People think if I can just get to the major leagues, just get to the major leagues. And they don't realize, no, when you get there, like this is when the game starts, right? Mm -hmm. Or you guys, like if we could just get to 500,000 subscriptions... It's when you get to 500,000 and then you start getting different guests and then the scrutiny gets bigger and then the comments get like, it, like, oh, this gets heavier, right? I also think that you have to be careful about not making marriage about what I get. It's about what we are building. And scarcity and novelty are ways to add excitement and energy and fun into a thing. But there's also long periods of just showing up and and like there's times when you go to the gym and your trainer's like um dude we're doing something totally different today and you're like oh my gosh and he puts you through it and you actually do it and you like get done and you feel all jacked up and then you're super sore the next day it's awesome you can't do that every time you go some period sometimes for months sometimes for years i just gotta go to the gym right and you're just going through it and going through it and going through it and in our culture we tend to in those periods relationally like oh it must be dead or there's no spark left or what right right and i think it's a balance of both and if you're constantly adding novelty and spice and spark at some point that uh, the house can catch on fire that's a lot of spark right and if you just let the whole thing go out you end up what we were talking about earlier like i just feel dead in my own house and so i think it's finding this balance and all that balance starts with me do you have a weekly get together with your spouse just to say how are we doing like, let's talk through our budget this week. Let's talk through, like, how can I love you this week? Who's taking the kids to school? Like, what does that look like? What does, what does your week look like? Now I've got seven different podcasts plus my own show, plus I'm co-hosting this other show. I'm going to be wiped out. How can I love you this week? This is going to be a week like for like probably less romance. I'm going to be exhausted when I get home. Can we just hug and watch a show? Can we just sit by each other and read books? Awesome. Then the following week, I'm going to have hardly nothing. I'm going to come home jonesing for a connection game on right it's that to me is the intentionality and then you can repel off the side and be like cool i'll add some novelty i'll add some spark i'll add some we'll we'll do some of those fun things that makes sense it all stems from are we going to be intentional about this and that just sucks because that's not how hollywood builds marriages now why do so many people say that marriage is hard because it is what's hard about it we're selfish beings man and we think we have pictures of what marriage was gonna i i think I used to think it was we had a picture of what marriage was going to look like. I don't think that anymore. I think we thought marriage was going to feel a certain way. Same as making a million dollars. I think we all thought it was going to feel a certain way. I remember one of the top 10 or 15 moments of my life was when the driving in a black SUV with the head of publishing handed me his cell phone in the back of the car. We were going to a book signing and Dave Ramsey's on the phone yelling, you're number one. And I was like, what? And he's like, you did it. You're number one. And he's going, woo. And I was like, yeah, thank you for your help. You you did this, man. He's like, no, no. It just whole thing, hung up the phone. And I was like, yeah, dude. And I called my mom. I called my wife. I went to a book signing. And because um, I'm a part of that giant Ramsey organization, there was a line out the door. And we were so, it was aw. And then I got to my hotel room and the door shuts. And then you go take a shower and you're like, number one. All right. And I, I had this fan. I, I don't, I didn't know what I thought, but I thought it would just feel different. And I thought a million dollars just shows up in your checking account. I thought there was like the number one book fairy just drops a million dollars in your account. And then you get the next day and you're like back at line in Southwest waiting the TSA line and your life just keeps going. I think we do that with having a kid. I think we do that with our jobs. We do that with our, when I hit milestone X, we think it's going to feel a certain way. 
And it does. So you think people are going into marriages feeling like they're going to be different? It's the, it's the it's, curse of the Renee Zellweger, Tom Cruise. Like, you complete me. I think I'm finally going to be whole. And then you realize, like all great counselors will tell you, all great psychologists will tell you that wherever you go, you go with you, right? You get married and you have this wild wedding and you have a great honeymoon and you get home and then it's Monday morning. You got to go back to work. And so you're back you in the would, same car in the same change, house. Though, people just didn't have that expectation because I feel like everyone says or you hear a lot of people say marriage is hard, but you never hear people say friendships are hard. Exactly. So what's the big difference between maintaining a friendship and maintaining a friendship with your wife or husband? Because I don't think we have, when I'm with my buddies, I don't have this expectation that I'm going to be complete in some way. I know Todd, and I know John, and I know they vote differently than me, and I know we have different economic thoughts, and we get together and argue, and we both like to watch the fights, and we both love each other's kids, and we both love our wives, and I've done life with those guys. I don't have an expectation of it's going to feel a certain way. When it comes to marriage, like... No, I need to feel, I need to feel like I'm a king. I need to feel like I'm great. I need to feel like I'm complete. I need to feel like I'm whole. I need to feel like I'm safe. Often somebody else can't give you that. And so you go through this, this illusion. It's a happily ever after. They never tell you, we never ask the question, what happens after you win? But, but that sounds like two people who are incomplete and in their lives get together thinking the marriage is going to solve something mm -hmm. and it doesn't versus two people who are just complete on their own mm -hmm. coming together. Do you think that that's a difference? No, because I think that person would be coming saying, Oh, nothing's going to change. And it all changes too, right? I, I, I think people aren't honest about it. I thought it was going to feel differently. Yeah. Cool. What's the biggest change about getting married? Graham's getting, yeah, getting married I'm getting married this year. Okay. Yeah. And I, I question how that's going to change the relationship, if mm. that makes sense. Because I feel like, you know, everything, we're going to continue to work just as hard as we have. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue to have ups and downs. Mm -hmm. I've never considered it hard. There's absolutely times you're frustrated, angry, sad, whatever, but I would never say it's hard. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious what a marriage would do differently in that situation. I think it's, um, A, you're probably more differentiated than most, right? You're, you're more thoughtful and think through very logically all these different emotions. I think where it gets hard is um, you get a call that your mom's very sick and she's got 48 hours and your wife, I'm making something up completely. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Your wife has heard you talk about you and your mom don't have a great relationship. And then you get a call that your mom's sick and she's got maybe 48 hours and you say, I've got to finish this interview. And suddenly your wife thinks that's your mom. And you think, well, I've told you we're not close. Like we have been estranged for a long time. And then she starts to ask, who is this man I married? Is he going to leave me? Right. And so suddenly th those kind of things will happen over and over and over and over again. And um, it happened through COVID. It really split up a lot of folks because the government said do one thing. And you might know your spouse was kind of anti-government, like they always ranting about whatever, or your spouse was super compliant, like whatever the speed limit is, they just drive the speed limit. But suddenly like. I didn't know you, right? So those things happen and that's that that's where it gets hard. Or you'll say something in a moment when you won't realize your wife was reaching out to you for something. She might carry the label wife differently than she carries the label girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Or you, the first time someone's like, oh, this is my husband, you might go, I'm hus right? Like it, all of it just shifts and changes. And at the same time, it doesn't feel like we think it's going to. So I, I think it's all a matter of coming back and saying month one, it feels exactly the same. Cool. You too? Yeah, it feels exactly the same. It's not we're really kind of anticlimactic. Awesome. Same team, same team. What's our budget look like this week? How can I love you this week? And it's continuing to come back to that well over and over and over. It's like going to the gym mm -hmm. so that you look up 25 years from now and you can still bend down and pick up your niece and nephew. So what are the things that couples could do to ensure that they stay together? A, decide we're going to stay together. I wish there was something more sexy and like five steps to, I have to decide this will never end and come hell or high water. We're going to figure this out. And then the second one I think is intentionality. I don't know intentionality as a psychological practice. I know as, as a physical practice, we get together once a week. I won't call you if I'm going to spend more than X dollars on a thing. I bought a red light therapy the other day and I called my wife and said, at this point, we don't need to call each other, but I said, I'd like to buy something that's obnoxiously expensive and it's a health and wellness gadget that may or may not work. What'd you get? Um, it was just a juve, um, like a big red light therapy thing that I can sit and meditate in front of. She's like, oh, geez, sure. But it was, we budgeted for it, it was planned and all that. But how much was it? Even, I don't know, it was 1500 bucks. At this point in our marriage, we don't need to make that call. Um, 
but that's just a part of our rhythm, right? And I never want to get out of the rhythm of we're touching, touching base, touching home base, touching home base. What's, what scares you the most about getting married? Honestly, my biggest fears are not really relationship based. Like my biggest fear is not, and I've been like totally upfront with Macy about this too, but like not being able to pursue dreams and passions, not being able to express myself and not being happy in what I'm doing day to day. Like those are my biggest fears. Mm -hmm. And so I was telling her like, and we've had so many great discussions too about like what we expect from a relationship and this and that. But my thing is, you know, I don't want to ever have to feel like I'm held back from pursuing something. And my things are usually like hobbies and work Mm -hmm. are the two things that I get a lot of joy and fulfillment from. And when I get really into something, it's just like, it's all I want to do. And so that might be the aquarium. Like it's never going to be like, oh, I want to go out with all the buddies and stay out three o'clock. For me, it's like, hey, if I had this really cool hobby like i just want to be able to do that Mm -hmm. and like hey if i'm on this cool project i want to be able to focus on this pro like that to me brings me a lot of joy Mm -hmm. uh that's my biggest fear is not being able to have those things but that's with or without a relationship that's just me i'm you know on my own i think that's one of the reasons why i was like always just saving so much money Mm. because for me, I want to have those options to be able to do the things that I really enjoy. Whatever shows up. Exactly. Mm. So it's less about like a relationship thing and more about like, how could I design this lifestyle where I'm able to pursue the things that really make me happy and fulfilled. Mm. And and again, it's all work and hobbies. Sure. Is there a chance that fully committing and going all into another person like this fills the gap that maybe a hobby was filling i've been 100 percent committed like yeah. that that's how i feel like mm. i'm not gonna get i can't possibly get more committed than i am now like i'm 100 percent in okay and i'm gonna stay 100 percent in. yeah so it's it's very cool it's hard for me to say that I'm, i would be like more committed getting married i'm like i'm gonna be just as committed i would challenge you to leave space for the opposite effect that maybe now i can do something i've never been able to do is just to share some of this with somebody and it will magnify my joy or love for it i thought i was into let me think say it this way mm-hmm. i thought playing guitar i've got guitars i collect yeah. them i love it i love picking up a song on the internet and trying to learn to play mm-hmm. in fact this year i started one of my goals and i didn't do it. i was supposed to do it last year didn't do it I'm supposed to do it this year it's not going great but i wanted to go learn the 10 my 10 favorite Weedle D 80s metal hair guitar solos. And now that YouTube's out, you can just you play by play, step by step, note by note, all of them. And that's awesome. I like sitting in my basement. I have a room where I write and do all my stuff and play guitar. I love doing that. It can't compare to jamming with a band, right? Mm-hmm. With a group of people in a room making music. Yeah. And so I can get that apprehension. Like I'm afraid I'm going to have to do husband stuff and ugh, it's going to take away from aquarium time. The other t- other side of that might be maybe aquarium time may be, become amazing and maybe become connected time. Maybe she gets her own aquarium or she starts acting. We, we do. The, so who knows? Right. But yeah, it, sure. it, it can be both both. And it could be an optimism for I'm always haunted and inspired by that old Brene Brown quote. Whatever you go looking for in the world, you're you sure find. to find. Yeah, right. I always want to think to myself as a way to shift how the, the lens, the glasses I'm wearing to see the world, not where's my time being taken from, but where can this accelerate and make this thing more pleasurable and more exciting and more joyful? If that makes sense. It does. It's just a frame for yeah, sure. experiencing the world. Okay. Right. But good on you, man. That's good. It's good that you even know that out loud and you're way ahead of the curve, but you said those things out loud. You yeah. said them out loud. Most people would just keep them quiet, yeah. get married and then get frustrated and then not say anything and then resent. I think both of us are like so committed mm-hmm. to making it work mm-hmm. that we like looked up all these statistics on saying like, all right, you get married at this age, you're less likely to divorce. Mm-hmm. You have like this, you're less likely to do like all of these things that statistically we know we could like, d- you know, mm-hmm. dwindle some of this down mm-hmm. and then work on a lot of things ahead of time to like know what we're getting into. And that's the big capital I intentional, right? Yeah. And y'all have done it in your own weird, statistically driven, nerdy way, but y'all have been highly intentional together. So good for you. That's awesome. Something that I've always had trouble with navigating because he'll come to me and he'll ask me questions. Mm -hmm. What should I do in this situation with with my my fiance? What should I do in this situation? How should I respond to this? And it's really hard because I would respond completely differently than he would respond. Give me an example. So for example, like I, unfortunately or fortunately, there are, you know, I'm, I could be potentially more combative okay. in, in conversation. Okay. So for example, like I will contend an idea that I do not agree with, okay. whereas he will be a little bit more avoidant. Like he just doesn't care about, you know, the other person not seeing that he's right mm-hmm. enough 
to, you know, to push that and to be like, hey, here, here's why I'm right or whatever. He doesn't care enough. He'll just be like, oh, whatever. I just want to avoid this. I always thought it's like fundamentally, it just seems like you're planting a very bad seed. Mm. You know what I mean? And this mm-hmm. can come up in the future. But after years of talking to him about it, it's like been the biggest wake up call to me, like newsflash, everyone's different, mm-hmm. you know? And for him, maybe he genuinely doesn't care. Yeah. And for me, that's been like the hardest pill to swallow when I'm trying to navigate how to help him out with something mm-hmm. is the fact that like, I just think like fundamentally, this is how human nature is. This is how I am. This is how I expect other people to be. Mm-hmm. But in actuality, maybe he genuinely is just like, eh, you know. I guess fine. my response to that is I tend to see the big picture. And mm-hmm. I'm like, how is everything going overall? Is this a big deal? No. Mm-hmm. Do we have a difference on this? Yes. Can I convince her? No. Can mm-hmm. she convince me? No. So it's fine. But like in the big picture. Control what you can control. Let's move on. Kind of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, overall, we have a great life. Mm-hmm. We're happy together. We want to be together. We're this, not, no one's leaving. Right. Like this little thing, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. And we could blow it up into something big, but it really, it's so insignificant in the mm-hmm. grand scheme of things that I just kind of think it, it, it doesn't make a difference in my life. Mm-hmm. And so. I would say going full circle, this is why that very beginning conversation is important. This is the root of why mental health practitioners don't tell people, well, here's what you should do. Because some people are like, I wouldn't let anybody talk to me that way. And some people are like, it doesn't matter. And so there is a, an important part of therapy is finding out, well, what does matter to you? And is that serving you well? Right. And so y'all just approach problems differently. Um, That's good. It's good that you know that about yourself. And more importantly, that you're honest about your partner. Like this is, these are the things that get me fired up. And these are the things that, these are the hills I'll die on. Do you have more hills that you'll die on than him or f- much fewer? Probably much fewer. Yeah. I think that overall, if everything is good, I'm happy. Mm-hmm. And so if there's like little tiny things, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't get to me. There's, there's little things that'll get to me mm-hmm. short term, but you give it like a day and I'm just moved mm-hmm. on to something else. I'm, I'm not just talking about like relationship problems. Mm-hmm. I'm just talking like a little work thing. You know, I'd come to Jackal, that, hey, this happened, blah, blah, blah. And it's really annoying. But then like a day later, I'm like, hey, you know what? That's stupid. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Not a big deal. Mm-hmm. How do you address uncomfortable topics with your partners? For example. Directly. Go right through them. I don't like that you've been gaining weight. Mm-hmm. For example, not finding your partner attractive, mm-hmm. you know? How, so you say just straight up? Because I, because. No, it, it, I. Um, I like the wisdom. Don't ever use the word you in a, in that type of conversation. I'm struggling with being attracted to you right now. I'm worried about your health. That is different than you did this because when, soon as you say you, I have to build a wall to protect myself. You just came swinging. I got to block. I got to block your punches. If I say I'm struggling with this, which is the real truth here. Mm. I'm worried about you, which is the real truth here. That's an invitation. And it might be a scary, hard, uncomfortable invitation. Hmm. But anytime somebody goes, you've been acting great, man, you're off to the races now. They have to defend themselves versus, I feel like I'm not being heard in this house. Like, that's me, right? And now let's have that conversation. It's fascinating. You talk about the difference between invitation and commands. Mm -hmm. And you said, it would be a gift to me if you did the dishes mm. rather than, I don't like that you don't do the dishes after you eat your food, mm. which is just a funny way of phrasing it. And it is fortunate, unfortunate. I err more on the side. I feel like in my gut that it's unfortunate that you have to play a game, but you know, to what? have conversations. It's, but it's yeah. not a game. It's hospitality. Does that make sense? It's, it's, it is, we have such an individualistic culture. Everything is about me. And so if I want a thing, it all begins with, you have to make my thing happen. I don't think it's, I don't, I don't see as much as a game. It's just a, it's just a new language. We had a divorce lawyer on James Sexton, who was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, gave yeah, a yeah, great yeah. example. He said that you uh, reward good behavior that you want to see more of. Hmm. And so in that case of the dishes, you could say something like, I absolutely love it when you do the dishes mm. and then afterwards we have all this time together and sharing like the, the benefit instead of, I don't like it when you don't do something. I like this when you do this Mm -hmm. and this makes me happy and excited and all these great things. And that rewarding good behavior does a lot better than shaming bad behavior or by bad behavior. I mean something you just don't like. Well, I think it's, it's one's an invitation. One's kind of, yeah. One is, um, I really feel love when X, Y, and Z. Yeah. 
who's not going to lean into that, yeah. right? I want, I want to do that more. What questions should you ask to your partner mm-hmm. before you decide to get married? When I'm talking about faith and finances. I think those are important conversations. How do we solve problems? Because there is going to be inevitable conflict. How do we come to the table? I think you have conversations about kids, even though all of that's going to change, right? You have no idea how what that journey is going to look like. And I'm not saying everyone has to have the same faith. What I'm saying is we need to have a set of anchored values, right? I often will just distinguish between values and beliefs. I want my values anchored in. For the Deloney's, one of our values is um, we believe in God. We believe in something bigger than us. What does that belief look like? That has moved all over the place. And I want my beliefs to change. That's why I sit with theologians. That's why I read books. I want my beliefs to be all over the place. And I want my wife to be somebody I can go and say, I think I believe this right now. And that's not challenging that anchor, right? That value. One of our values is curiosity. So that means we're always allowed to ask hard questions in our marriage about anything, right? About politics, about religion, anything like that. And it also means we don't land on the same place a lot. One of our core values in our family is not we will agree on everything all of the time. That's a that's a recipe for disaster. But one of our core values is curiosity. Ask anything, man. And I'll still love you, even though I think you are a goofball on this particular topic, right? Um, but I think a good place to start is family and a discussion of faith practice. What does that look like for you? None. Okay. What does that look like? Kids and finances. What did, uh, I'm interested to know what Sexton had to say. I think it was just very like, what are our expectations of the relationship? What are your roles? What are my roles? How are we going to do finances? Uh, who, what, what families are we going to see for the holidays? I think it's just a lot of the very practical mm-hmm. questions, like the everyday it's boundaries. Yeah. yeah you know, Who's going to take care of the kids in this situation? Who's mm-hmm. going to do? I, I think it was uh, uh, religion. I think was a mm-hmm. big one. How do we how do we celebrate or practice religion? Mm-hmm. A lot of those questions that I think any like premarital counseling sure. would encompass. We dig into yeah. A mild change of topic here, but do you think gender roles in relationships exist? And if so, do they exist for a reason? I do. Um, I think they have shifted dramatically, and we haven't been completely honest about how dramatic that shift has been there can be a masculine and a feminine role right there are times i take on a feminine role in my house right there's times i'm gone and my wife will take on a more masculine role she'll she'll have to deal with accountability and correction of our kids right and there's times when she's gone i'm a safe place and so i think that energy will shift and move i think for again as we talked earlier for most of human history guys had bigger muscles and so they did different things and women had smaller muscles and did different things and now our economy has shifted to where most of the money is made with our heads and most of the muscle things have been replaced with robots and so you have an economy that has grown to scale here that is rewarding people who go to college and can sit at a desk and type and think and solve problems as a team and you've got a very individualistic i do these these tasks i shovel coal i fix cars i do things and those jobs are gone right and so i think there's a shift that's happened dramatic shift that's happened and now the roles are a mess I think they're a mess and we don't have a way to talk about them inside of our house. The most important thing for me inside homes is that people talk about roles. Like, as you mentioned earlier, like who is going to be responsible for X, Y, and Z. And I think ha- I care less about what these societal bell curve kind of roles are. And what did y'all two agree in your home? What's this going to look like? And if that role becomes a burden or if somebody's not upholding their role that y'all talked about, how are y'all going to come back and repair that? How are you going to come back to the table and say, I'm not okay? That's way more important to me than the bigger, more instructive ones. What do you think about that answer? I like the answer. And I I think the suggesting the importance of roles is something that's incredibly important. I think I don't want to improperly um, give this idea Mm -hmm. to somebody, but I think it was Ben Shapiro that said, what do they write on your tombstone? Mm. It's your roles. It's like father, Mm. you know, a great son, uh, let's say a loving husband. And those are the things that people spend so little time focusing on. There you go. Yeah. But that's your role. That's what they're writing on your tombstone. That's what's actually important. And I think really people figuring out what their roles are and how they can be that role the best in the best possible way is very important. So for you two, both of y'all as of now Mm -hmm. aren't married, don't have kids, knowing they're not going to write world's greatest YouTuber on your tombstone. They might. Maybe. They might. They <laughs> Mr. might. Mr. Peace probably has. That's right. One. That's right. But yeah. I hope they don't. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Does that motivate you to do something to inject some sort of action into your lives? Or is that something to just go, eh? I see it as eh. Because I feel like I'm, I'm dead anyway at that point. So as long as they made a positive impact, I okay. don't care. 
Okay. Um, I'm more concerned about like what can I do now that has a, a bigger impact than just me. Okay. And I like to think that the podcast is a way of doing that. Okay. Excellent. What do you think? Yeah. The idea of a legacy, obviously is somewhat important. Okay. I don't think that it's the most important thing. For example, the, the reason why I was saying that the roll thing on the tombstone is not because then everyone sees that and like, oh, this is awesome. This guy mm-hmm. must've been a great husband or whatever, but it's to challenge your beliefs of how you're spending your time currently. Mm-hmm. That's right. More so in that category than, you know, being proud of your legacy when you're, you know, your brain isn't working. Hmm. Very cool. When do you make a decision for someone else? If ever, for example, you're in a toxic relationship mm-hmm. You're with your friends and maybe one of them wants to continues talking to this girl, but you know, it's bad for him. And Mm -hmm. it's like, yo, like, like, I don't want to be that guy to tell you to break up, but you have to trust me as your, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like really forcing your ideology on them versus kind of letting them figure it out for themselves. How do you delineate between that? I don't see that as forcing an ideology as much as I'm trying to push you out of the way of a truck. I would much rather somebody push me out of the way of a truck and I get all scraped up and the truck wasn't going to hit me them them not try to push me out and it does right and so my friends know deloney over loves all right i'll call you and say dude how's your marriage you all okay everything cool um and then when it comes time to like have a hard con- like you need to not be with that person i'm gonna go back to i don't use the word you there i'm gonna go back and say every red flag in my life is going off right now i'm worried about you all right. And I'm not going to lob a grenade at you because then you got to defend yourself. Um, if I think you're going to hurt yourself or take your life, then I'm going to interject myself in that situation. But when it comes to like a relationship, a marriage, a faith practice or whatever, I'll say, here's how this is impacting me. And that's, that's sometimes scarier than just to say like, you shouldn't be doing this. It's easy to throw grenades. Are you happy? I, happiness is not a metric that I care a whole lot about. Why is that? Cause it's cocaine and fireworks and cotton candy it's just a byproduct of a of us it's a it's a sparkle along a well-lived life you don't think that happiness is kind of like the anxiety where it's it's an alarm that's telling you that things are great that things are working no because i can be happy just hammering a bag of gummy candy that's really bad for me and so uh, happiness is a dangerous dangerous light to follow what about joy Joy, or something more deep joy is joy is the path right you can y'all have probably heard me talk about this my one of the most important stories things i ever saw was my granddad was 93 and um he di- he passed away he was a world war ii vet he raised four amazing kids my dad and my aunts and uncles at his funeral we're at the burial at the at the, at the graveside and these guys are out there playing taps with the with you know everyone's going to get a rose and put it on the casket and my son was really little and he escaped and he got out of my grasp and he ran over and then climbed up on the casket and got one of the roses and put it on top. Because he just saw everyone else doing that and he wanted to participate. And it was this really rad four generation. My son is the only Deloney male. Like he's it, right? He's the last of the, last of the line. And it was, all of us were there. There's nothing happy about that moment at all. But it was right. My granddad was 93 years old left an amazing legacy, defended his country, was a great man, was like active in his church for 50 years. It was right. That was, there's a deep joy in seeing that legacy connect in that beautiful moment. Nobody's happy there, right? And so I think joy is this underneath, are we on the right path, right? I'm not happy at the gym most of the time. I'm not happy being exhausted and being sore and like, um, occasionally I'm happy in there. But if I waited to be happy to go to the gym, I would never go, right? But man, feeling good and pushing myself hard early in the morning, late at night, that's joyful. So it sounds like it's more of a stability and just an overall higher vibration to put it into terms that maybe- Almost a lower vibration. You think, when I say like vibration, okay, now I see what you're saying, vibration. It's a root system. Yeah. Right, okay. It's not a piece of fruit. The fruit comes once a month. I mean, uh, for a month out of a a year, 11 months, there's no fruit. Mm Mm-hmm. But that root system vibration in a positive way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. In stumbling on happiness, Mm -hmm. they talk about that's Dan Gilbert, right? Yeah. 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 How different people have different levels of happiness. So, for example, uh, I think I'm a ten out of ten. Okay. Right. But let's say we actually plot that out on a graph. Mm -hmm. I'm a six out of ten. Okay. How can you know if you're truly if you feel joy, you can convince yourself of anything. I can mm. convince myself I'm happy. You can convince yourself you're angry, right? But mm. what are you actually, and how do you know what you are? What if you live your entire life actually just being a six, but you think you're a seven and you just didn't know it could get better? Then who cares? I think that's been some of the 
empire building that's gone on globally where people move in and try to tell other people, no, y'all aren't living right. We have a better way for you to live. Do it like us. And I think that happens all over the world. And you realize, um, I've talked to some, some, uh, military folks who are like, what are we doing? Like we took a perfectly happy group of people living very differently than I'm going to live, but they're perfectly happy. And we said, no, 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 this is how you have to do it. Now we've created a mess. Right. And so I think the, the notion of like, what if, what if, I think that can be a haunting question. I tend to, the, the driver for me is peace. That was the driver of that whole book. Like, can I put my head on my pillow and just fall asleep? Can I just drink a cup of coffee with my wife in the morning? Can I walk out, walk into my home and feel warmth instead of, here we go again. For me, the barometer is peace. It's not, am I at a seven of happiness, a 10 of happiness? Cause that's just gonna, it's just gonna be a stock ticker. It's just gonna go up and down depending on whether I've got diarrhea that day, right? Or what I ate for dinner that night before or how good my hair looks. I mean, it's all, that stuff is just, and I think we get so, because we can, kind of like the same with people who are so obsessed with market ticks every two or three minutes, they make themselves insane. And because we have such fine-tuned microscopes for looking at those things, we miss macro trends, right? You can't see the solar system with a microscope. I'm way more worried about the solar system than I am these little bitty TikToks. I want to see the trend, right? You talk a lot about the pathology of discomfort Mm. and comfort uh, and about Mm anti-fragility. What does that mean to you? And how do you see this as a plague that's affecting people and how they can use this knowledge to better improve themselves? One of the most important books I ever read was Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. And um, he has another book out called Skin in the Game, which may be the most important book I've read in a decade. And I was with Michael Easter last night, the author of The Comfort Crisis. But this idea that in pursuit of a more comfortable, less stressful, less painful life, we accidentally created a world where our bodies just fall apart right? And our psychology falls apart. Um, We literally have everything now. You can turn your air conditioner on and off, your, your, your fake climate inside your home on your cell phone, and you can push another button and food would just show up here. You can push another button and water would just show up at that, right? We have all everything and we are as bananas as we've ever been. And so reverse engineering that we've created a world where we go into the weight room and everyone's taking all the weight off the bar. And we're wondering why nobody's getting any stronger. I think what everyone's beginning to slowly realize is strength happens after the discomfort, right? So find the most uncomfortable path to where you're going. What does that mean? Um, Yeah, you don't have to get a PhD to know about counseling anymore. You can read a bunch of books. I challenge you to go five years with a group of people. that are going to challenge you and get pissed at you. You're going to have to write papers for all these different professors, which means you have to learn to speak all these different languages. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get rejected. You're going to send papers that get rejected. It's going to be hard. And when you walk out, you're going to really know the stuff, not just here, but you're going to know it here. You're going to have to have seen clients and have multiple people watching you see clients and somebody contradicts the other. All that's iron sharpens iron. It's a refinement process. And so um, I think we have so many easy paths um, and I have made it a point. I want to, I want to take a more difficult path if I can. Do you think people create problems though, because their life is so yes. great? I just last night yeah. had dinner and one of the people at the dinner, she said, I'm, been in Vegas for 15 years. And I said, um, what brought you to Vegas? And her response was, I'm from Cuba. I'm in Vegas because I was fleeing communism. And we all laughed. And I said, that's maybe the best answer I've ever got from that question. But I then asked, does it drive you crazy being here sometimes and listening to the complaints people have? And she said, you have no idea how hard it is to hear people talk about how great the world I ran from is and have never experienced it. And that was her sentiment. Y'all are creating things to get upset about. Um, Globally, I mean, like everybody, no, there's real trauma, real evil. We all know that. But she said, systemic, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're inventing things to get mad about. Seems like it's a part of human nature to require adversity of sorts. And if you That's aren't it. suffering from a roof over your head or, you know, feeding your family or something like that, then you're just going to naturally in your mind, uh, create adversity well we 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 left the weight room and we left the farms and we even left the factories and we moved into the classroom and so all of our sparring is intellectual and so we don't box anymore in pe class we intellectually spar and now we have allowed words to hurt us i even let me get i'd love to get y'all's wisdom on this um 
I said something on my show recently, and I don't even remember what it was, but somebody wrote in the comments, um, how, how dare you shame me like that? And my first impulse was, I don't have the power to shame you. I'm just a clown in Nashville, like running my mouth on a podcast. I don't, I don't have that power to speak into your soul unless you open the door and let me in there. Do y'all, is that right? Maybe I'm wrong on that. What was the context? I, well, I tend to agree with you. Uh, um, I know I can shame my son because there's a power hierarchy. Right. My boss can shame me. There's a power differential, right? But when it's two people sitting at a table and I say, I think that shirt's stupid. You have a choice. Are you going to care what I had to say about that shirt or no? I can say, man, you letting your kids have a cell phone is ridiculous. You're going to melt their brains. You have a choice as to like, well, I think Deloney's a moron, right? Pass the salsa or... No, I'm going to let that worm its way into my soul. That was an important hmm. conversation I had. It, I remember, here's the, here's, the sto- here's the story, and then I'd love to get y'all's feedback. Yeah. Because of my crisis background, they let me into the counseling PhD program. It was like the faculty had to vote on it because I didn't come from a traditional path. I didn't have a master's in counseling, so I came from the outside. I already had another PhD in education, and I had this crisis experience, and they said, okay, you got to take these courses, but we'll let you into the program. What that made for, for me, was a really interesting dynamic because we had all these mental health professionals who were trained. They're amazing therapists. They were doing work in the communities already, and then you had me. And so they would, we would, somebody would ask a question, and I would be like, that's a stupid counselor answer. I don't buy it. Or they would all look at me and go, how do you not know that? That's basic humanity, right? So it made for a good dynamic. Well, I just started my practicum seeing actual clients. And I was stunned at how intimate those moments, how intimate those sessions were and how fast they got intimate. People were hurting and they were just so ready to lance that boil and say, this is what's happening. And I was like, whoa, we're just going there, right? And so again, I'm a newbie figuring this stuff out. And my professor came in and gave a case study. And here was the case study. You see somebody for six months and one day they walk in and they just say, you suck. I did your little exercise on how to ask for a raise and I got in trouble. I did your other little stupid exercise with my girlfriend and she left me. I've given you $3,500. My life's still terrible. You suck. And I just, you know, it's in, in the, our program, we were all sitting in like our desks were in a circle right? as a small group and a little cohort. And I go, Ooh, that'd kill me. And my professor pointed and goes, why? And I was like, dude, that's, those sessions are intimate. That would destroy me. If I'm working with someone for six months and they just walked in there like, you are terrible at this. And another, um, one of my colleagues, she's an amazing, brilliant woman. She said, oh, John, they don't get that. I was like, what do you mean they don't get that? She said, John, they don't get that. And I was like, oh, is that one of your little counselory things? And she said, no, you get to choose who hurts your feelings. She said, people can take away your livelihood. They can take away your life but you choose who hurts you. And so if you're somebody on the street, lob something at you, nice hair, nice face. What I get to decide whether I don't know, whatever. I'm not going to accept yeah, that. Yeah. Now it makes sense. I do agree with you. And so yeah. I'm wondering, I can hurt my son because he's looking to me. He's a sponge, right? My boss can hurt me. There's a power hierarchy there. Um, an abusive husband can hurt a wife with words, right? And, and, and vice versa. But on the whole, Do I have that power to shame you guys? I think fundamentally, if you just look at data, and this is me just Mm -hmm. suggesting data, um, people obviously will be products of their environment. People will be shamed if they feel like you've shamed them. Hmm. Now, is that your fault? And is that their responsibility to respond to that stimulus in that particular way? I think it is people's responsibility to carry themselves however they they deem worthy, right? Okay. So in the the four agreements, people's behavior is not a reflection of whatever stimulus you put on them, but of themselves. That's like one of the agreements that you're supposed to make with yourself. And I think like you said with your kid, as you're younger and maybe more impressionable and you haven't like, I don't know, transcended that thought pattern or whatever for lack mm-hmm. of a better term, then yeah, like people are going to be like that. But ideally you always shoot, you aim to, you know, be... um impervious to stuff Mm. like that and to be responsible for the way that you feel. And I think also preaching that uh, is more loving than preaching something like, oh yeah, you will be a product of your environment. Mm. I think that as I'm hearing you say that, and I'm processing out loud here, it can't happen in a vacuum. You can't get your feelings hurt by what I said, unless I've also communicated to you, it's your job to find out what you believe and what you value and what you think about yourself. And if you do the work to root yourself into something, then somebody like me comes on and goes, nice hair. You can go, my hair looks good. I'm, I'm good. You know what I mean? And it does, by the way. But you're rooted in something. It's got to happen in a context, right? The, the problem is you can become dogmatic without even thinking you're being dogmatic. There you go. You know? And you're just living your own life. Mm. Uh, and, you know, you can't blame you 
for doing this, mm-hmm. right? Like you didn't, you were unaware that this could possibly have an effect on someone else. Mm-hmm. Is it your responsibility? Probably not, mm-hmm. right? But eventually you you find the best way to go. And maybe you'll learn eventually, right? That if this is actually truly the case, that you should accompany that with this idea of figure it out for yourself and, you know, learn and try to transcend and be impervious to other people's thoughts, yada, yada, yada. So that goes back to that discomfort question. Mm-hmm. I think if you default to curiosity over judgment. It's so great. if you yeah. all two say right. something and I instantly feel bad or feel a sh- like shame, then I can lash at y'all and judge you, mm-hmm. shamers, or I can be curious to why did my body just respond like that? Well, I think a lot of it is is taking criticism um, or shame from people that you would ask for advice from. And that was a, I, I forget where I heard that, but it's like uh, when it comes to like any constructive criticism, like don't take it from the people who you wouldn't ask for that. Mm. And so it just, it, it It's separates. that whole cell phone question, right? Yeah. Like if you have a problem with me, text me. And if you don't have my number, then I don't care what you have. Yeah, yeah pretty yeah. much. Because I think a lot of people throw mm. their own thoughts at something, but if you wouldn't ask that person or, or, or trust their judgment in mm-hmm. particular, you should, probably shouldn't be taking their advice. Or their well, criticism. and I also, yeah, and I, I the, the layer to that is I, I remember, I mean, I worked at the university for at different universities forever, surrounded by brilliant people. And I would say, hey, what do you think about this? And that question to a academician, to a thinker is, here's what I think. And they can write you a paper on it. They, like, here's the 10 studies and here's the this. And I remember asking a buddy of mine, hey, what do you think about X, Y, and Z? And he's like, told me, told me, told me. Here's what I think. I think this. And then his kids come running in. Mm. I don't remember what it was, but like, what do you think about sugar? And it's like this, this, this. The kids like have, you know, a Capri Sun and a candy bar. And I'm like, wait a minute. So I realized I was asking the wrong question. So I just started saying like, what do you, do you let your kids have sugar? And if they're like, yeah, on occasion, that's all I need to know. Right. What do you actually do? So instead of like, what do you think about the bond market Mm. right now? I ask you like, hey, what have you done with your money in light of the bond market? That's what you really believe sure right? that's what you yeah, think sure i think promoting curiosity rather than like you know the gut response to something mm-hmm. is just an amazing but again thing. some people could be great at giving advice mm-hmm. and it's correct but really bad at implementing it themselves and i think sometimes when people are removed from the situation they could give really great advice even though they themselves don't follow it give it's me like, an example of that i i i just don't people who the relationship I, advice is the cliche. One. I guess it's so, like, because you're so removed from it that you could give great advice, but like still have a crappy relationship. But like, hey, the advice is pretty good. And see, I would challenge the advice. Then. Yeah, maybe. You know I, mean? I, I would know. challenge just, that advice. I, I don't know any specific examples, but I'm mm. just trying to like throw yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, something I, out there. I much rather look at somebody's life. Okay. Like showing up here, seeing how you carry yourself, seeing how um, like meeting you and coming into your home validates the parts of you I've seen on your show, right? It, mm. it it almost begins to complete a picture. Sure. And so that paints you as a trustworthy person. If I got here and you were like, your house was like sketchy and you didn't like, you're like, hey, dude, we're just, we're, this is all a ruse, man. Like, <laughs> right. Um, Got some money. I'm actually man. not neurotic at all. Hey, can I borrow 10 bucks for Uber? <laughs> right. Like, um, sure. I would ask like, are you the guy that should be teaching America how to deal with their money? Right. I would, that would be a question I would have. Right. Um, or y'all all have had interview, like interviews with people or met people that are talking about mindset and, and joy and kindness and they're jerks to deal with, right? And so you begin to think like, man, you're the right, you're the right person to be carrying this message. Cause I always want to see that's an old, it's an old uh religious tenant, an old scriptural tenant, mm. but you'll know by the fruit, man. You can say I'm a this kind of tree, this is this kind of tree, I'm this kind of tree. Let's see the fruit and see what kind of tree that is. Mm. Two Maybe hopefully pardon you of any of that. I don't, I don't think that should bother you, by the way. What's that? Whatever the comment that that. Oh, it, it said. didn't, but it, it yeah. sparked a. And that's great. You, I think it was you that said this, or maybe it was someone else. Uh-huh. Don't want to credit you poorly. I'll take the credit. If it's but good. it was it was when someone says something mean to you, or or something that could be potentially like offensive or something like that. Instead of going, Ur, you go, hmm. hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was yeah, you. Instead yeah. of going, hmm, you go, hmm. hmm. And I think that's an amazing thing to teach. Yeah. yeah. And. I have to do that with the positive stuff too, mm-hmm. because I think it's too easy to get overinflated. Mm-hmm. I mean, you rush. This is the best report I've ever seen in this boardroom. To go, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? Um, like, it's the best book I've ever read. This book changed my. It's the best. I. It's not right. It's 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 good. I'm proud of it, and I'm not ashamed to put my face on it. There's some great books out there, right? So I think it's it's holding both of those 
curiously. One question I've always loved, and I've finally been able to frame it in a way I think is really interesting. Okay. Are white lies ever okay? So, for example, if a barista asks you, how are you doing today? Mm -hmm. And your mom just passed away and you're not doing well. Mm -hmm. What do you say? Me personally, I would say today's a really rough day and I would offer this person a scaffold so that they don't feel responsible for holding me up. So if I went to get coffee and I'm headed to talk about my mom's funeral because she just passed and the person's like, how's your day going? I would say today's a really rough, gnarly day. And I'm super grateful you're here to give me this coffee because I've just relieved you of now suddenly you have to prop me up and fix it. Right. Cause we're, we're relational beings, right? I don't think white lies are ever wise. I just, and I get it. There's a social lubricant. They make they they can lower conflict, especially short term. Um, I just think it's much more instructive to um, have the conversation you want to have. I don't remember where the quote came from, but conflict deferred is conflict amplified, especially in those around. The more you just, no, oh, it's cool, man. Do I look good in this? Yeah, yeah, great. The more that goes on, the greater that pressure builds that it will eventually erupt. But what if in the pursuit of saying, hey, do I look good in this dress? They just want a compliment. You know, how much of that is simply just they're looking for a little encouragement. And even if the dress doesn't look good, you don't want to be the one. Hey, listen, I hate the dress. That's, you know, how do you contend with that? I'm just trying to play devil's advocate. Yeah, I, I yeah. mean, with those that I care about um, or that I trust care about me yeah. man i hope you love me enough to be like don't wear that shirt on stage and i'll ask my wife am i okay to wear this t-shirt and she'll say it's too small not in an ugly way in a thank god somebody told me way right okay. um and so i think the greatest compliment i can give you is i love you enough to tell you the truth and if you're just looking for like a do i look beautiful and you have to ask for that then i'm letting you down i'm not honoring you god. so if that's what she needs you she should get that nice. before you, she asks for that's it. fair something that's trending right now is at what level should parents accept their child's quirkiness and uniqueness versus apply corrective behavior so for example let's say your kid's like a furry mm -hmm. right and it's like okay so i understand you're quirky and you're unique and you should love your kid for mm -hmm. what makes them different i mean that is you know what is them essentially what differentiate differentiates them from everyone else let's say they have a unique sexual interest that you mm -hmm. disagree with or mm -hmm. they're into furries or whatever yeah, yeah yeah at what point do you stop supporting that and you apply corrective behavior. So let's take like the furry, for example, right? Versus like a Therian, right? So like a furry is somebody who, as my, again, these definitions shift. And so I apologize if I don't get it, get it right. Um, who likes to pretend, right? To be a raccoon, a bear, a whatever, a fox. And a Therian is somebody who will say, no, 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 I am. I <laughs> am this, right? I identify as, this is who I am. I want my kid, and I've talked about this, I talked about this on my show. I want my daughter to have a wild imagination. That's how kids process how the world works. That's how they become victorious in these stories they tell about themselves. That's how they process trauma. Kids speak and play. I want that. That's why play therapy is how people do th counseling with kids. You want that wild imagination. And then what? And then what? It's when you allow your child to disregard the social context with which they live and letting them become um, the epicenter of your home. Meaning, we're not going to let you go play soccer because you have to walk on two feet and they won't let you crawl around on the, on the field. We can't go to that restaurant anymore because they won't let you sit on the table and eat from a, like a dog bowl or a cat, bowl, like whatever. That's when it becomes destructive with your kid. And so I think there has to be some sort, I, I don't know another way to say this, but some sort of rational adult in the room to say, dude, I want my kids, especially when they're young, I want my kids to dress up. I want my kids to run around. I want them to have wild imaginations. And when my kids gets to high school, like I did, I played dress up. I dressed up like I was this cool punk rock, heavy metal guy. And then also like I would dress up like I was cool youth group guy. And then I got to college and I grew my hair real long and I, and I tried to dress like Pantera because I was like, yeah. And then I shaved my hair all off and I tried to be all prop. We're all trying on different things. And I think that's fine and good, but it has to happen in a social context. I can't show up and be like, I'm a metal guy. And then show up to church with a like 
a profane t-shirt on, then I'm stepping outside of the bounds, right? The only way I can tell you is you got to have a rational adult in the room to say, we're walking into a restaurant, take off your mask and take off your tail and we're going to stand up, right? Where do you balance that to prevent your kid from getting bullied? Like, let's just say they love this shirt that Mm -hmm. you're wearing and it's their favorite shirt and they're proud of the shirt. Mm -hmm. But you know, if they wear that shirt to school, Mm -hmm. they're going to get picked on. Yeah. But you also want them to, you know, be themselves and Mm -hmm. you want them to feel comfortable to, you know, that there's going to be adversity in the world. Mm -hmm. I went through that with my, with my son and, um, I ended up fracturing our relationship more than I helped. And like, just to provide some context at the high school I went to, our football coaches would, is a Texas high school football. It's all the stories are true. They would pull our hair down. And if it came past our eyebrows, we got sent home. Like it was like, the hair couldn't touch your, I mean, it was, this is me. I'm not that old, right? This isn't a long, hundred years ago. This is my childhood, right? Um, if you dyed your hair that you're out, I mean, you're just out. And that wasn't off the team. You're out of the school. I went to a 4,000 student high school. It wasn't a little bitty podunk place. It was a giant public school. And so things have shifted really fast. And my son entered middle school. I've got some scars from middle school, things I still remember that kids said to me. And so every day, don't wear those pants, fix your shirt, turn your shirt around. What about, are you going to, you got, your socks have to, it never stopped. And I found myself picking and picking and picking and picking. And I remember the day that I said, Hey, um, I'm going to turn you over to the middle school wolves. You're my son and I love you. I'm going to stop talking about your clothes, man. If we go to church, I'm going to ask you to put on a nice pair of sh- pants and a nice shirt. If we go to a funeral, if we go out to a restaurant with your grandparents, I'm going to ask you to fill in the blank. And that's me teaching him time and place. And I think as a culture, we've just thrown time and place out the window. We just, it's it's oppressive. It's rude. It's, it's not. It, there is such thing called time and place. Um, and so, but I quit. And to my dismay, his friends just say, well, that's just him. Like he wears different size socks and they roll with it. And they ended up being much more accepting and compassionate and loving and they poke on him. Right. And vice versa. I I'm just not going to die on that hill. Um, I will be there if someone's going to hurt my kid. Right. If my kid was really into something and they're going to get beat up about it, or they're going to get bullied about it. Um, I want to be honest about that conversation. I do think we've hit the pendulum so far trying to eradicate the world of bullies, which I, that's great. But in the process, we've stopped teaching kids how to respond when they do interact with a bully. We've just said, hey, y'all sit over there. Y'all can't handle this. We'll go clear the deck for you because people in my generation were bullied so bad. And so we tried to rid the world of bullies. There's always going to be that guy. And there's always going to be people who are squashing on kids. And so we have to do our best to rid the world of bullies. And also we have to do our best to sit in that discomfort with our kid and be like, man, I'm sorry they made fun of your favorite shirt. It breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart, right? And I'm going to sit with you in that and not be like, oh, I'm going to call the, right? Because when when you jump in to try to rescue your kid like that, you're teaching them, you can't. You're not strong enough. You're you're too weak. You're always going to be weak. I'll fight this for you. And there's some battles I got to fight for my kids. Right. But some of them, the more important thing is I'm going to sit with you and say, I'm so sorry. Yeah. That breaks my heart. Where do you know how to fight those battles? It's messy. It's right. messy. Yeah. When it comes to violence, when it comes to physical violence, I'm going to be pretty out front. Like I've seen those TikTok videos where the father shows up at the house is right. recording and is like, you know, your son did this to, right. and the comments are all praising the father. Like, yeah, go dad, go dad. Um, you know, it's tricky. I had to situation. go to a couple houses as a kid. My dad took me and it was for me to apologize. And so that was the right thing to do. And that's those things, they still haunt me that I would, that I was ugly to kids when I was young, right? I hate that. I hate that. And it happened. And I think that was right. I've been on the, that end of that phone call, another parent calling and saying, hey, I think this thing happened. Let's talk about that. I think that's great. And that's fine. That's how adults should talk to one another. Where it crosses the line that somehow like, I'm going to go macho up. And I'm, it, that's a strange dynamic, right? Um, and also, have to, I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth here. Schools just let crap go now, man. And I used to, there used to be some, I remember my dad saying, I'm just going to call coach because I know coach will, right? I know that you'll pay for this at some point, right? And pay for this. It's yeah, that's something sure. dramatic, but I'll just let coach know this happened. I'll let coach know you didn't turn those assignments in. He'll, he'll take care of it, right? And there was a little bit, that's, that's gone now. That's gone. And so I do understand if nobody's defending your kid, if you have called the school and called the school and called the school and they're like, well, you know, we're not going to, do anything. I get getting to the point where I'm going to come knock on your door and say, hey, what's up? It's when it turns into theater that 
um, that's when people get hurt. What worries you the most about your kids growing up today? They're growing up in a time of highly, highly dysregulated adults. The adults in their lives have gone crazy and the adults in their lives are raged out, anxious, frustrated, depressed, um, glued to screens. And we have pulled the pillars out of every one of our kids' lives. They now believe after COVID, doctors are trying to kill you and your teachers are trying to kill you either because they made you wear masks or they didn't make you wear a mask and your churches are just political messes now, which they are. Your politicians are trying to kill you. And so we've given our kids this, how are you going to grow up in that? Um, a buddy of mine, he's a, a psychologist. He calls it hope sickness. Kids growing up today think they're going to be dead in 35 years or so. What do they, what do, they do with that? Right? What do you do mm. with that? And so that, that freaks me the most out. Um, I heard this recently and it really touched a nerve with me. Um, it was a clip of a man from a stage and he said, I don't want to hear another person say kids these days have changed because they haven't. It's the adults that have changed. And that's true. And how do you prepare your children for that? They have to have an unshakable anchor that come what may, you can always come home. And there's not a thing you can do. And that's why I hesitate with that question a little bit. There's not a thing you can do. There's not a line you can cross that you can't that I won't love you. You may be unsafe and I, you can't be in this house, but I still love you. We'll figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's letting them know and not through words, but it's through showing up and showing up and showing up and giving them a model of here's what a regulated adult looks like. Here's how you tip well and take care of a waitress. Here's how you love somebody that you're in disagreement with. Here's what happens when mom and dad get in a big disagreement and how they come back together and repair. I want my kids to have a picture of that. So when it happens in their relationships, they've got a model for it, right? What if people don't have that? Then your next adventure is to go find mentors that you trust. You got to find adults. That goes all the way full circle with when someone says therapists for kids or there's too many therapists and they shouldn't be going. There's some truth to that. And also, okay, what do they do now? If you pull the last thread they got, sometimes a counselor at school is the only person who will talk to them, the only person who will process their emotions with them, the only safe person they got. And it's not ideal. It'd be awesome if they had a mom and a dad or they had parents who were sitting at home. But they don't, right? They don't. All right, John, final question of the <laughs> podcast. Ready? Go for it. Where do you get your black shirts from? And is every black shirt exactly the same? Ooh, that's a great question. I am 99.9% .9 sure this is a package of black t-shirts from... Walmart? And no, I don't think they're all the same. But hopefully my answer tells you I'm not super concerned about them. <laughs> I wear them because they just, it's one thing. I remember reading about, you know, some tech Steve guy, Jobs or somebody did it. And I just thought, a, a mentor of mine, um, we talked about him earlier, the guy was a monk, he, he just dressed in all black. And he had some spiritual reasons why he did it. And I still don't know why. He never would disclose that. But I just remember that argument about it's sim simple. It just makes things easier. And I thought, man, I got a pretty chaotic mind that can spin up anything for any reason. It just simplifies my life. Hmm. And I appreciate you. What brand is this I, one? I, let me see. You got it. Oh, all right. Let me lean up. <laughs> uh, good fellow. So that's Target. Target. All right, we just it's looked. It's good fellow. It's Target. Never know yeah, you know me. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I like it's my Target. I was feeling tees. a little bit bougie this time, so I got them from okay. Target. Okay, nice. Yeah. All right, John. Thank you so much for coming on the Ice Coffee Hour. Really appreciate it. If there's anything else you want to say, guys, get his book. All of his links down below in the mm -hmm. description. Just anything? thank you for your hospitality, man. You're welcome. Like, thank you for like, coming on. Y'all don't get to see that. Like, y'all are two kind guys, and y'all are so prepared and professional. It's awesome. Thank it's just you. refreshing. It's cool. pretty rad. Thanks, John. Yeah. Appreciate it. Until next time. Cool.